tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to Tinfoil Hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Are you ready to get your mind blown? Good morning, Swarm, and welcome to Tinfoil Hat. You know I am. You know what I'm here to do. I'm here to join me in all his flaming glory, Ooh. Xavier Guerrero, <laughs> and on the ones and two, Jay Nice, Johnny Wood. Johnny that's, Wooder! That's some shirt. That is some shirt, bro. You said some guy just gave that to you? You look yeah. like you just entered a food truck in a NASCAR race. That's what that looks like right <laughs> I, there. I wouldn't win. Guys, what did you call it before? I forget what it <laughs> Senior was. Fury. Senior, Senior Fury. Senior Fury. Fury. Hey, guys, real quick, go to samtriple.com for all of your uh, all my tickets. Uh, right now, I only have one show up. There should be two more shows coming. I have uh, at, uh, September 12th, I will be... At the, um, I will be at uh, Comedy Chaos at the Comedy Store, and then uh, on the the 30th, I'm in Vegas at Skank Fest, okay? And we got some great affiliates. If you're looking to make your life better, you want to get into with our affiliate program, you'll hear about that a little later on the show. Uh, but I'm very excited to have our guest, because we are in it. He's got a book he's working on right now about the subject we're going to discuss. He's got a great YouTube channel called Understanding Conspiracies. Please welcome to the show, Paul Stobbs. How are you, Paul? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, Paul, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry if it's been a little weird, but you know sometimes it gets weird on the show. Uh, but we're very <laughs> thankful to have you on. And for our listeners who may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where our listeners can find you? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm a YouTuber. I have been on there since 2014. Um, I, I generally make videos about all things conspiracy related and have done for a long time. Um, and I've inadvertently found myself uh, creating a theory um, while researching biblical history about the way the demons and Nephilim of the ancient past may have looked, called the Nephilim look like clowns. Um, like I said, I'm currently writing the book on this right now. Um, I did take a break from YouTube for about five years, from 2017, um, but this current year I have come back, and um, I'm back in full swing now, making content on that subject. Um, I myself have been... Um, kind of grew up in the... Uh, atheistic worldview you know i wasn't really ra raised a religious person and um, through my teenage years you know i've always been an artist i have my own degree in fine arts um i kind of went down the new age gnostic psychedelic consciousness exploration routes you know um and through that i kind of ended up on youtube um and through my work and research on there i, I have come to the realization myself personally you know that i am I'm fairly confident in saying that the biblical perspective offers a lot of answers um, to a lot of historical questions that I had personally. Um, and I've had a few spiritual experiences which have proven to me myself, you know, that uh, God is real and so is biblical history. So uh, I guess to wrap it up, that's that's me in a nutshell. And today I'm just going to talk to you about my theory about the uh, Nephilim. And I love it. The origin of the Psalms. I love it, bro. I'm right there with you. I'm much older than you, but I'm on the same spiritual journey. Uh, I'm getting Christ in my life. I had some guy going, how can you call yourself a conspiracy theorist and you're a Christian? I go, I don't know, man. It just works. It's just what I'm into. Yeah. And I'm, you know, so I'm going to get my buddy from, uh, that's been on the show before, uh, El Dorado, he's known as, and we're, we're going to have mom, we're going to have some fun talks. Is, uh, you know, I was in upstate New York this weekend, past weekend. And we had some deep talks, and it was a really good conversation. And uh, you know, I'm 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 getting into it, bro. And like one thing that really resonated with me, and like when you said you were, used to be atheist, that like I was like, wow, dude, this is kind of fitting right in with my conversation I had with El Dorado. 
um, was that when you t- tend to talk to people who are atheists, and listen, again, this show, I will, I will discuss anything with anybody for the most part. You know, there are things where I've had conversations with people before, then I start getting credited with what they said, and I just don't want that. If you come on here and say some stuff, I want you to be credited what you said, and I'm going to be credited. Whether that's realistic or not, that's where I'm at. This show's about allowing a lot of people to come on to say a lot of different stuff. Um, so, but, so if you're atheist, that's fine. Like, I'm not here to tell, I'm like, I'm really not here to tell people how to live their life. That's it. I'm on my own journey. If you want to join me, come with me. If you don't, that's fine as well. But we had this real discussion and, and, you know, he sent me this video and it's like, uh, you know, and it basically the title, I'm not going to say the title of the video because it will give away what my point, but the whole discussion is why are, you know, atheist people, well, you know, why do they tend to be atheists? And there, there's a couple reasons. And one is that something super tend to be something super traumatic happened to them, like really traumatic. And it gets and it upsets them and they don't know why loving God would allow that to happen. And then the second thing is um, there's so much pain and suffering in the world. Why would a loving God allow that to happen? So as we had this discussion yeah. this weekend, I Tony told me something very interesting. This is based in the Bible, says straight in the Bible. And that is, if I had to ask you guys right now, the two of you, maybe Johnny will know. If you, I had to say, who is the ruler of this realm? Who would it be from a biblical point of view? It'd be God. Okay. Uh, well, the devil is, uh, is uh, you know, the ruler of earth right now. Yes. Right? Yeah. Did you know that? Do you there's know that? Like, there's now a, he's he's like, got a title, but I can't remember. The second he said that, I've, I'm, I grew up Catholic. I should have been like, yeah, I should know the answer to that. that that's why the, this place is considered so crazy, hell. You right? go up to heaven, yes. Right. So there was a rebellion, according to the Bible. There was a rebellion. He fell. Well, even, even after he fell, he tried to come up again and got knocked down. But God, according to the Bible, put him in charge of this. So, like, I'm I'm in the same place as you. Does any of that, what I said, resonate with you, Paul? Uh, yeah, well, to be honest, you can't talk about my theory without getting into a bit of biblical history first to set up the context as to um, why why I even have this idea that clowns are in any way related to the giants and the Nephilim of the past. Um, so we can get into that today if you want. We can even start with that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can give you my, yeah, you know, my yeah. viewpoint on the yeah. history. Yeah. Okay, so let's get sure. into it. Let's let's start. Let's let's. Because you 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 grew up with. What are your parents? My father, uh despised the Catholic Church. Okay. Well, that's the other way too. You said tragic stuff happens. Also, people, and this is in that book we read. That book I gave you. Uh, people are often so atheists now are often abused by the church i mean victims of the church yeah. in yeah. many ways Which or could be some in, in, in very father. in very bad ways like we're talking about child abuse but also in very subtle ways by like, like people who just use the bible like a, a a weapon you know because you i grew up with people like that who use the bible you know to beat you over the head and make you feel guilty and and you know make you feel less than yeah uh and that's another i mean and they're just you know hurting yeah their own i cause. get it dude. I, I think I, that's how a lot of people get there because i grew up religious then i Became atheist because you know you you grow you become a teenager and you're like I'm not doing that, but then I thought I was gonna be atheist my whole life and now that I like into conspiracies if you believe in if you believe in adrenochrome and that Hillary's evil and all this stuff then there has to be a good yeah you can't sit there and no, be like I'm all these you. people are evil and they're the devil yeah then who's God and who's gonna be That's not it. A, yeah. we'll get into I want to get into that towards the end too but um where do you want to, yeah I'm with you dude I mean my dad my dad a lot of crazy stuff happened to him and that where it comes from abuse. Or, or like um, a tragedy and trauma, or just not understanding why the world could be so crazy. Yeah. And that's what it is. So, uh, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul, where, where do you want to start? Uh, well, let's start in the beginning, shall we? Um, first of all, on, on the stuff we were just discussing there, um, I, I am a non-denominational kind of Christian contrarian. I wasn't raised in a church. I don't speak fluent Christianese. I don't sound like a Christian to most people. And uh, the worldview and what I'm about to explain isn't exactly mainstream churchianity's view on this on the biblical past. They probably won't tell you this stuff in Sunday school, let's say. Um, but this is from my own research into conspiracies. Like I said, um, I, I couldn't have witnessed all the Satanism in the world without realizing the opposite is true too. That's kind of what it, it always inevitably leads most people who start researching conspiracy theories. 
Um, a lot of my channel is about explaining the the conspiracy theories journey. It's kind of like the hero's journey in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's a process, you know, and most people do come at it maybe from an atheistic standpoint or a new age spiritualist standpoint. And by the end of going down all the rabbit holes to the final conclusions, and they usually come out Christian by the end of it, <laughs> because that's where the actual truth really is. If you want to talk about the truth movement. And um, so that being, that being said, you know, that's for context for my words that are about to come out of my mouth, the type of person I am and how I view all this stuff. Um, it comes from a very outsider perspective to Christianity, not through the church, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, so most of my, biblical history understanding i i agree with somebody called gary wayne who uh, did a lot of work on this and wrote a book about it called the genesis 6 conspiracy i tend to agree with most things he said so most of my worldview is is, is pretty much identical to his and i i am going to try and summarize it for you very quickly today obviously uh, but i would recommend anybody to read his work on the matter to get a, a more rounded in-depth picture of what i'm about to say um, but to understand why the Nephilim look like clowns, we first have to understand just who the Nephilim are exactly. Um, so let's talk about this uh, this creation event and the rebellion you mentioned earlier about Lucifer, um, the fallen angel, the seraphim angel himself. So in, in the beginning, I, I believe personally, um, and this is where the contrarian view kind of comes in, is before Adam and Eve, um, before the story as we know it as, you know, God created man and woman as Adam and Eve. I do believe there was a, a creation before that of people. They call it the, the day six people um, theory. Um, now, it's all justified in the biblical canon as it does say, does say God created a man and woman, plural, and then told them to go out and subdue the earth and be a caretaker for the world, basically. And then later, um, a chapter and the verses later, it then says, and then God created Adam. So there's two a creation events as far as I'm concerned, and there's a lot of um, theology to back this idea up. And also just world history outside of the biblical narrative does seem to back up this idea as well, that there was a time really far back where basically angels kind of ruled over these peoples as watchers, as gods, let's say. And there's a good example in um, a Mesoamerican and North, North American um uh, like ancient culture, the Pop of Vo explains the story of um, a similar god, um, which is basically an analog to, to Lucifer. And most people who have interpreted it can tell this is basically talking about a Lucifer esque creature uh, who was um, basically a giant that walked among these people, ordained in gold, had a golden throne, had jewels all over his body, just as um, Lucifer is described in the Bible. And in, even in this ancient uh, you know, Mesoamerican culture describes the fall of this creature getting so haughty and rebelling against God, basically. So even outside of biblical canon, there seems to be precedent for this group and of this people before Adam was created. This is Lucifer. It seems so. It seems so. Yeah, it seems like um, there's analog stories for prideful gods like Lucifer all over the earth. Um, so either, either way, there was this creation event where there were these people and i do believe during this time and this is what most people who've done the research in this realm believe is the angels themselves were kind of gods among these people at that time and um, they were the rulers the watchers they were known as in the book of enoch um, and it was their, their job to basically make sure humanity was all right but also they kind of had the perk of being able to be gods ab above them and many of them were worshipped like gods and it was kind of a balance in a way is this any um, connection to anunnaki in a sense yeah yeah, yeah, and that's that's another example. Though I would say the that that story is from a, a perspective where it well, it's it's from a perspective of other peoples who saw them as something that they weren't, saw them as uh, the creators of themselves, the creator beings and gods. But I think there's a bit of a lie going on there, a bit of a myth. I think they were certainly the creators of the Nephilim, and I think it's a, it's a Nephilim creation story from the Anunnaki perspective. Can um, I ask I a question? Like, is, Go ahead. Yeah. Is is the is the nephilim in the bible yes okay yes um, in genesis 6 it says explicitly uh, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of god came unto the daughters of men and uh, they created nephilim giants uh, basically um, yeah, and the these bible became says kings, that? These, yeah they became the kings and rulers over everything yes. for a short time Okay. Um, and this is what we're getting into. It. Why, why did that even happen, though? Like, why did these angels come down and do this? This is kind of what we have to understand. And this all goes back to the rebellion you were talking about earlier. It does seem like um, when God decided to 
pick Adam from these people and pick a human being and put him in the Garden of Eden, as it's described, and then start teaching him stuff and giving him the the honor of naming all the animals, something even the angels hadn't been given. I think some of the angels, Lucifer, the main one being, didn't like this. They didn't like the, the idea that a human being, these things they had been watching over for so long, was about to be given kingship and rulership over creation. I think the the serpentine seraphim angels, which is what Lucifer is, and we'll get into that later, descriptions of the seraphim. Um, but these angels were... Uh, he was full of pride. He did not want to bow down to a human being after ruling over them for so long, basically. So a third of the angels agreed with this rebellion for that reason, because they had spent a long time on earth watching over humans as gods. So this whole uh, God deciding to make a, a, a puny, stupid mammal like ape creature uh, ruler over the earth when clearly, you know, we are the serpentine a a angelic beings who uh, are clearly our superior why would we bow down to these things? And that was the rebellion, basically. So real and quick. It was that decision. So, so what I'm trying to understand is based on the Bible, you're, God yeah. created this realm for angels? Not necessarily for angels. No, I think I think the human, the human was always the plan. I, I think angels had a short period of time where they got to kind of be above mankind and, and kind of um keep an eye on them you know and as, as gods let's say um but then obviously god had his plan to choose a, a creature in his own image which was adam you know which was human which was man and then put him into this garden this, this place called eden there's plenty of debate as where eden actually is and i'm not here to sell that debate today but it was a place separate from the earth in in a way it was, or maybe a place designated on earth but it was a special place which not everybody got to walk freely, you know. Uh, so Adam walked with God very closely. And I don't think the angels appreciated seeing that. It's jealousy. Jealousy and pride is basically, that's the root of it. That's the source of the first form of jealousy and pride in the earth. And there is no more prideful, jealous angel than Lucifer. You know, that's kind of the point of his yeah. of his image as a character. Yeah. Um, and it was that I will be as God attitude he had. I will... You know, mankind will worship me, not the other way around, was basically his his sin, you know, his pride. And that's what got him cast down uh, out of heaven, basically, and what started this war. So it, it seems like uh, now it's we all understand the Garden of Eden story that mankind didn't last very long in there. Adam and Eve were very quickly ousted, you know, um, because they were convinced to do something they shouldn't have done, which was rebel against God. It's all about rebellion. Um, God said not to do something. A snake-like being um, of some kind called the serpent. We don't know who that is. It could be a race of serpentine-like reptilian beings that maybe walked on the earth at the same time Whoa. as man, or it could be simply. I'm you know, people say, <laughs> you know, people say maybe it's Satan, but um, if you look at the description, it doesn't say it's Satan. And I think it's this case of you know birds of a feather flock together situation. I think if there was a serpentine race on the earth at the same time as as humans then they would probably side with the serpentine angels. It's kind of like we're on their side and we're not going to let the man being take over and rule when clearly the reptile is more superior type of attitude. So this serpent who clearly was allowed to walk around in the garden, you know, was clearly a creation of some kind who, who was trusted, also rebelled against God and convinced his creation that he had chosen to rebel against him. And God saw all this and basically said to the serpent, you know, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and human seed. So there's forever going to be this Whoa. war between the serpentine race and and the human race because of what you've done today. Damn, and people have theorized bro. also. Sorry, go ahead. Wow, that's crazy. That's yeah, nuts. it is crazy. <laughs> it is. So th this is this is. I'm, I'm speed. I'm forwarding here. No, so it's I'm great. You a, I'm into this, dude. Story, this is you know? my jam right now. This is what I'm all about. Yeah, so, so summarizing, let's move on from that scene. Adam and Eve are now cast out. That serpent being has now been cursed to wander on his belly forever and eat, eat the dirt. So it seems like those bipedal walking serpent people aren't around anymore. If that, if that was what we were talking about there, the p punishment was to lose their limbs and just become like snakes. So I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Um, you can make what you want of that information, but um, it's possible people have theorized that um, obviously, Cain and Abel were born after this, once they were outed out of the garden. And it, people have said that Cain is not 
truly um, the son of Adam. He is actually a result of that serpentine race mating with Eve. That God, was one these part bitches of the sin are scandalous, I mean. bro. They're yeah. all scandalous, dude. <laughs> They're scandalous, yeah. dude. You got like, I love women. God bless you. But guys, you got to pick your chicks, okay? Mm. You got to pick your chicks. <laughs> I didn't Logan Paul, are you well, listening? Yeah, I didn't expect her to belong to the streets. Yeah, like, dude, uh, yeah. Eve belongs to the streets, Yeah, bro. dude. I didn't wake That's up today so thinking Eve belongs crazy, to the streets. bro. Dude, Eve belongs well, to the streets. Well, it's just a theory. <laughs> it's just a theory, you know. So I'm, I'm not here to say that is definitely what happened, but there are people out there who say that that may have happened. Hence the whole your seed and their seed will not have to fight each other type of thing. Well, there's clearly some kind of seed cross-contamination happened if they're talking about this. Imagine being cheated on by based. not with not. She didn't even pick a human. You know, there's no humans to pick. She <laughs> picked a snake, you know? That's, there's nobody around well, except after, snakes. After he snake, gave her her rib, a bonus was, snake than you. Maybe. Damn, bro. Yeah, maybe, maybe, For the street. Maybe it was forced. We got that. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. Yeah, it, yeah it, we, it, could be, we, we could be slandering her name. Shirt that E's for the <laughs> oh, dude, that's going to sell We're out. We're going to make that shirt. Only 100. E was for the streets, bro. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make that, dog. E yeah. was for the streets, dude. All right, go on. Sorry. It's a tough one. It's, it's, it's a tough one. No, it's a tough. It's a tough one to hear for a lot of Christians. That and but it, just bear it in mind as a possibility. Let's not dismiss everything just because it sounds scandalous. Is kind of my attitude towards it. Maybe that is the case. Maybe it's not. Irregardless, there's still you could still leave that to one side, and the theory will still carry on as normal. Um, so, but it's something to bear in mind. College football fans, are you ready for Week One? Yes. <laughs> DraftKings Sportsbook <laughs> is hooking you up with can't miss offer to start the season strong this week. New customers bet just five dollars on college football and score two hundred dollars in bonus bets instantly. Anything can happen in college football. Your team can go from unranked to dynasty mode in just a couple of years. Change comes fast. The only thing that's locked is this great offer from DraftKings Sportsbook. So here's what we need you to do. Life's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code TINFOIL. New customers can score $200 in bonus bets instantly when they just bet $5 on college football. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the code TINFOIL. The crown is yours. Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about our friends at Manscaped. That's right. Listen, fellas, are you running into a little stubble trouble? Okay. <laughs> are you dreaming of a clean shave look? I do all the time. But hate going through the hassle of a wet shave every other day? Yeah, I am all the time. I know you are. That's why we're partnered with Manscaped, the brand for below the waist, is coming to save your beautiful face. Yes, sir, Manscaped now has beard products and is going to a step further with the launch of their brand new handyman electric face shaver that's right the handyman electric face shaver it's designed to give your face a smooth and chiseled finish without the mess of a traditional shape make sure to join the nine million men worldwide who trust manscape with our exclusive offer head over to manscape.com and use the code Tin foil for 20% off and free shipping. All right, dude, I love it. One of my favorite things to do is when I go to the uh, to the uh, the barber and they clean my face up is when they get the machine on my the little zzz on my face and it's clean as a whistle. That's my favorite part. Now I don't have to worry about going to the barber. I can just do it at my house. Clean as a whistle. No stubble, no trouble. With the handyman. With the handyman. Your face is the first thing people see when you walk through the door. Give them something to look at with Manscaped's handyman. For me, being able to shave up to three days growth without the mess of traditional shaving is priceless. Mm -hmm. With Handyman's skin-safe technology to help reduce nicks and cuts, you can finally feel confident when going for that close shave. I know I'm always afraid of nicking myself, come out looking like Freddy Krueger. Mm -hmm. For wet and dry use, feel free to bring this anywhere and everywhere. The compact design and airplane friendliness make this the perfect travel tool for on the go. So let's do this, guys. So get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code tinfoil at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com use the code tinfoil hit the refresh button with the handyman so adam and eve cast out the garden they're now left in a world full of 
people. You know, they weren't the first humans on the earth. Like I said, they were set aside from the rest of the humans and groomed basically to be leaders. Um, but then they failed miserably and were cast back out into the earth in a world full of people that already existed. Uh, these people of day six we mentioned earlier. There were already cities established by this point. It says um, once Cain was um, cast out for murdering his brother Abel, he basically went to a place called Nod, which is a city, a, a well-established place that had a name, clearly. There were people already there. And he took a wife. And then from that, he had a son called Enoch. And then he built his own city called Enoch from there. And uh, now, obviously, Cain had rebellion in his own heart. He murdered his own, his own brother. And this could be a part of that seed war, that serpent war, the serpent seed fighting against the uh, the human seed, the pure lineage of humanity against the serpent seed, which might have been Cain and Abel fighting each other. The first, the first murder happened there, you know, the first act of rebellion happened there on the deepest level. And it seems like it's ingrained in the DNA of the people who have this trait, this reptilian serpent trait. And the whole point of this, don't forget, was from Lucifer's original rebellion. It's basically, look, if you're going to cast me out and, and make me worship the humans, I'm going to destroy your creation. That was that was what he set out to do. That's what this whole corrupting the seed idea was. And you'll find that the, um, the Old Testament is just a book about lineages. It's obsessed with making sure the lineages have been documented from Seth and Cain all the way down to Noah. Then after the flood, it falls it all the way down to Jesus. So it's it's about making sure that that bloodline never got corrupted. And that's what the whole point of the Bible is trying to explain from start to finish. Um, and it seems in this antediluvian age before the flood of Noah, there was a huge battle going on of some kind between the Sethite lineage of, of humans and this Cainite lineage, lineage of corruption. Um, now, Cain obviously was a murderer. He, he had rebellion in his own heart. He didn't want to obey God. He was angry with God. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, let alone just casting him away from family. And um, Cain was given a mark, but Cain basically said after he murdered his brother, you know, God said, right, get out from here. Cain was like, I can't, people will kill me. What people? I suppose the earth is not supposed to be populated according to mainstream understandings. But if you understand that the earth was full of people by that point, um, he was given a mark that was basically a warning to others that if you do anything to Cain, then your punishment will be worse. It'll be sevenfold. You know, the curse will be far worse. Yeah. Um, so C Cain was kind of made immortal in that sense. Not that he was immortal, but that people wouldn't dare kill him through fear of the wrath of God upon yeah. themselves for doing such a thing. Um, but during that time, it, 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 there's been arguments about what, what this mark was. And it's probably, this is probably the first clue to our theory why it's necessary to say but from, if you read the book of Lamech of Cain, now it's an extra pseudepigraphical text. It's not biblical canon, but it's a book of the time, um, possibly antediluvian. It's supposedly released by the Vatican in 2019. This is a very old book that has just been released. And it's, it's from the perspective of Cain's lineage. So the book is mainly talking about Seth's lineage more than anything. But this is from the other side. Can I ask and, you a quick uh, question? Go ahead, yeah. uh, are you Catholic? No, I'm non, okay. I'm non denomination. And again, nothing against Catholics, but do you trust anything that comes out of the Vatican? Um, you're going to take it all with a pinch of salt. That's kind okay. of my, my view on it. All right. Uh, again, yeah. number love. <laughs> just <laughs> Vatican shit. You've got to be careful. You, you do have to be careful with it. Um, but what, what is interesting about this particular book is that it, it, it gives a specific example of what the mark of Cain could possibly have been. Oh. Um, and what is interesting, it, it describes it as having leprous white skin. Now, not like me, not like a pasty white boy from the <laughs> north of England. <laughs> right? No, I'm talking I'm talking like white, like vamp vampiric. Like we're talking beyond the wall. We're talking white Game walkers. of Thrones, <laughs> white walkers beyond the wall. Creepy white, yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? Like, they look dead, bro. like a dead a dead body white type of stuff. And that was the mark, basically. And that was They were said to have for seven generations. And that was interesting for my own theory where we talk about the Nephilim look like clowns. Let's just bear that in mind for now. Put a pin in that idea and let's, let's roll the story on. So by the sixth generation of Seth, this is when the angels descended. This is what the Book of Enoch talks about in explicit detail. So six generations after... Adam, them, yeah, down to Seth. The angels seem to descend, and they seem to make a deal um, with Cain's lineage specifically. 
And again, I think this is, again, a case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is that kind of situation. Lucifer, these rebellious angels, are not happy with God or his plan or humanity. Cain, not happy with God or the plan. Both rebellious. Humans, angels, make a pact there on that side to basically continue to corrupt God's creation. That's the plan. So Cain's daughters are then used, basically, to breed with angels to create what we call the Nephilim. Damn, bro. And that's what... That's where they come Damn. from. Um, and like that's everyone the in the is. Bible's for the streets, dog. <laughs> They're all for the streets, yeah. dude. <laughs> Honestly, it's messed up. The stories that are in some of these extra biblical texts, especially the book of Lameca Cain, it's it's horrible, the stuff that was going on, man. Like, it is graphic. Like, it is very graphic. You know, the women who birthed these giants died at birth with this thing exploding out of them in a oh hideous my form. God. You know I mean? Like, pe people were, like, drinking like blood aliens, everywhere. Dude. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> It was a messed up place. The antediluvian can, world. Can I, my can I ask you really quickly? Because I, I think this is kind of a, a foundational question to what you're talking about. It, time is kind of a funny thing in, in, around this period and in the text, right? As far as the, the length of a human life, but also the pacing yeah. of those books. Because you can have a page that can be centuries and then, you know, a page that takes quite a different... What, 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 would, what would you say about human the human lifespan around this time? Uh, what is a generation? It seems to average about? around about nine years. Uh, repeat you the broke up you broke up during that um yeah so the average human seemed to live about 900 years okay. maybe more 900 uh, they, they, yeah 900 years yeah they very rarely seem to breach over the thousand year mark um the nephilim themselves were immortal souls they could live forever just like the angels but their lifespan it says in the bible by god was limited all of mankind's life was limited to 120 years just before the flood I'm sorry. What was um, that about remorseful, remorseful souls? What could you repeat that? They were the Nephilim were immortal souls. Oh, they immortal! I thought you said remorseful. I'm sorry. Im immortal souls. No. Got it. No, which totally means they were. I, I know what immortal means. Yeah. Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> but you went, but for you, the people at home. You said immortal, but but not really, right? Is what you're saying? Well, the God God limited the lifespan of humanity to 120 years. I mean, we have an immortal soul too. Don't forget. I mean, um, when we die, we don't die physically. Uh, we're, sorry, spiritually speaking, right, uh, but our bodies do. Okay. Nephilim could have gone on ever, you know, physically as well. Um, but it was all. We'll get into the story. The story continues how the Nephilim ended, um, and it you know it was all. It was a huge battle. It was a horrible war. Basically, had to take place. Oh boy. Um, so. It only took about four generations from the initial incursion of the fallen angels mating with human women. Uh, four generations down the line, the whole earth by that point was corrupted. Um, every kingship and rulership had been co-opted and replaced by giants. Because who the hell is going to stand up to a giant? You know, these people took over quite easily just by virtue of being extremely huge. Um, there also a lot of... Um, Religious cults were being made around that time, which were uh, esoterically occulting information about God and making people direct their worship towards nature, the sun, or the pantheon of gods, which were the fallen angels who had rebelled, basically. Uh, so we had the pantheon of many angels, which were posing as gods. These are, let's say, the pantheon of Greek gods, Norse gods, Egyptian gods. Um, there's many pantheons, all the Hindu avatars and gods. You find it everywhere, these pantheons all over the place. I would I would posit that they are remnants of ancient stories of fallen angels, the, um, the Watchers, who pose themselves as like God. So they became the gods, you know, and all direction and attention was on them. Just below them, they had the earthly potentates, which were the giant offspring they created, which were basically like the brute force, keeping people in line, monstrous things that were there that no one could stand up to or fight against. And then below them, they had humans who basically joined in with these sacrificial cults and became just like the Nephilim in attitude and rebellion and, and, uh, actions because the Nephilim were cannibalistic in nature. They ate each other and they ate people. You know, they were they're described as just being oh. tyrannical rulers. That's what Nephilim translates to uh, tyrannical giants, basically. Really? Uh, Nephilim. So they're just going around eating what? people. That's that's scary. They sound scary. Well, they Initially, if you look at the Greek pantheon's version of this, obviously you had um, the Titanochomy, which was the fight against the Titans and uh, the the gods of um, Mount Olympus. Now, this is a story that, that will make sense as I go on, but um, these gods were creating demigods originally, which were heroes. And they're described in the Bible in Genesis 6, you know, men of renown, heroes of old. That's how they were first described. Because I do think at the beginning, these giants were seen as 
wonderful, powerful beings who were amazing and people looked up to. And they were defeating monsters, you know what I mean? They were fighting animals with ease. They were throwing lines over their shoulders, you know, and they were they were what would be scary to a normal man was nothing to these things. So people did worship them quite quickly as gods, as heroes, as as super powerful beings, you know. But then as they got bigger, mankind couldn't sustain them anymore. And it's mentioned in most um, extra biblical texts, uh, Enoch, Jasher and Jubilees, that once humanity couldn't sustain them anymore, they started eating people. That's what it came to because they kept growing, they kept getting bigger, and um, human food stores weren't simply enough. You know what I mean? And these Jeez, things didn't have crazy. a things had a lust. Suck. You're like, dude, we're out of food. What are we gonna give this guy? <laughs> yeah, it's it's messed Sorry, up. Sorry, in the jails, Honestly, you know? ah. and, and we're in the worst yeah, state. All <laughs> age are terror. They are they are the most terrifying things I've ever like read. Basically, like you do not want to live in that time. And thank Damn, God we wow. don't live in that time is what i'll say yeah and as, as time as time went on god said right enough is enough and not all angels obviously rebelled against god not all of those angels who did mated with human women only 200 did okay and it's described they're all named by rank and by the tens below them and these 200 watcher glass angels who did choose to do this they were punished for what they did for creating the nephilim and it's um, it's interesting because in the book of um, I think it's Enoch, it's described that um, the archangel Michael is witnessing the punishment of the angels, and what he basically says is this. I'm going to paraphrase his words because it's all in like old English, you know, <laughs> language. But I'm going to put it in plain English for you. He says, Gabriel, what I'm seeing right now is absolutely insane. I am shaking. I am terrified at what I've just witnessed God do to those angels. There is absolutely no way any angel will ever do that ever again by virtue of what I've just seen the punishment to be. <clears throat> and the punishment was basically those angels who created these uh, first giants had to watch those children. They're described as their beloved ones. So their children kill each other. So these Nephilim weren't very intelligent necessarily. They were power hungry monsters just like their parents, full of pride, you know, and hubris. And they basically wanted to be the only rulers of the earth, so they started killing each other in power struggles and petty squabbles for power and land while the angels had to watch. And then, not content with that, the Nephilim then also turned against their own parents, the fallen angels, thinking, we don't want gods above us either. And this is, where, this is where the clash of the titans comes in. In Greek mythology, it's the, the titans versus the gods of Mount Olympus. Oh. That's the giants versus the fallen angel watchers. It's the same allegorical story, just with a different nuance and cultural perspective. And you'll find that all over the place, this, this battle was taking place. In the Tuatha Danan story in Ireland, for example, it's the Formorians versus the Tuatha Danan. Again, it's the, it's the angels versus the deformed, monstrous being giant things. Uh, these these analog stories are everywhere that describe this battle that took place. And the whole earth was decimated from these giants clashing with each other and ripping each other apart, basically. <laughs> and it's possible evidence that people have gone into this in the conspiracy Bro. that you can see the bodies of these giants in the earth you know they are enormous and they make up the mountain ranges of today let's what, say or even higher. Bro, what are you telling <laughs> me that mountains are dead nephilim well it's, some people have theorized that and shown some compelling images that may suggest that that is the case okay, but i, I, I got know. a real question for you do you think godzilla was a nephilim is that the story? Uh, well is he that was like certainly a giant reptile and you know if we're going to get into what the nephilim look like in a minute then it's possible that it, there is some basis in reality Whoa, for what they're trying to describe so all those old monster movies were almost stories of nephilim i think yeah well I, th I think godzilla was actually supposed to be like a metaphor for nuclear weapons if i remember reading yeah, correctly about yeah, that one yeah <laughs> but that's super interesting i know godzilla's not real but like <laughs> But when you talk about the Titans, because, you know, it's very interesting. You're now seeing the story of Titans coming back, right? Like, it's in all these movies, Titans, Battle of the Titans. I forget what awesome monster movie that was where the crack, the floor would open and eventually a Titan would come out and they would have to battle my, the uh, Titans. I forget. My favorite was the one with Arnold when I was a kid. 
Clash of the Titans. Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So good. Dude. Yeah, but man, that's so interesting. I think the new Godzilla is has some Titan in it as well, man. That's interesting. Oh, well, I mean, well, it, had, it had Hollow Earth. Yeah. Remember that one? That, that, the, the last one they came out? But there's a new, there's a movie just came out. I just can't remember the name of it where they would wear like giant robots. Pacific Rim? Is Pacific that Rim, bro. Yeah. Was all came about out like the, ten years ago. <laughs> but no, there was another one that just yeah they came they released them yeah. I, is there you. a third one? There was just a brand new one that came out a couple oh, years because I love monster movies and these these titans they were called the would come out of the Middle Earth and rise above and then they would have to battle them with giant robots. But they were called titans. That's so interesting, dude. Pacific Rim Uprising. Tw yeah, yeah, 2018. Yeah. All day. I could watch that all day. Oh, yeah, but. I think they got a new one, number three. Yeah, I the mean. Black. What do you mean, number three? But the new uh, Godzilla it's, movie it's involves on. Titans. Anyways, I know we. this is not a Godzilla think, movie think. podcast, but. <laughs> yeah, go on, man. <laughs> that shit was. That's amazing. Yeah, well, you find, you find it's all connected, really. M most media is is retelling old stories. That's kind of where they get their inspiration from. And if you don't know the old stories, it's all new to us. You know, it's all fascinating to us and interesting, entertaining. But uh, it's, there's nothing new under the sun is a famous quote from the Bible. And I think that's what we're hinting at there. Uh, but either way, this giant battle happened with the fallen angels, the Nephilim. Or, these are the OG Nephilim, the original huge things, the first of their kind, you know. But uh, before all that, the Nephilim themselves had also mated with uh, human women and created kind of like a smaller version. And these were known as the Nephil. But then those Nephil had also mated with and created you know that, who that reminds me of? LeBron James and his kid, right? LeBron James is a giant Nephilim. And they mated with this tiny chick. And now <laughs> Bronny's like way smaller. Got in the field, yeah. He, yeah the field. His heart couldn't even fit, and yeah. then he got the giant heart with the regular human body. Right, but it's kind of yeah. That's we'll get. That's a whole different discussion. Mismatched parts. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Sorry. I, I, welcome to Tim Fall Hat. We just go. It sounds on. like a pretty I, interesting world, though. Like a, a, a dude, big I can zoo. hear about this all day. Big time. But imagine that happening then. The people would get smaller. As the, the, the Nephilim gene would get more diluted as, as time went on. Mm. But the, the original big ones, as far as the story tells, is they were, they were done for. They were huge, in, impossible to manage, just destroying the earth and all its resources. You know, they, they just had to go, basically. And that's what happened with, obviously, the Clash of the Titans story is another way of outside of biblical canon to explain that. But it's all explained thoroughly in the Book of Enoch as as it went down and the book of giants as well, which is another book that was found with the dead sea scrolls in the, in the Cam uh, Qumran cave with the book of Enoch as Did well. You so say it's all the book of giants. That sounds, there's a oh, that sounds awesome. It's from their perspective. It's from and the it's giant Wait, They got their own take on this. I love that. Wow. What? All documented. Honestly, it's, 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 inc it's an incredible story. Uh, either way, it doesn't end well for them. <laughs> Put it that way. They were, and there was no forgiveness for them. There was no hope. They even tried to get Enoch to ask for forgiveness from God on their behalf. And Enoch did, came back and said, nah, bro, they're not having it. Like, <laughs> uh, you got me in trouble for just asking, okay? <laughs> basically, yeah. And what they had done was unforgivable, basically. It was, it, and they couldn't... In the grand scheme of things, their existence just wasn't feasible. Like it didn't matter if they even had a change of heart; they couldn't exist in that world with people um, cohesively. It just never, it was never going to work. Basically, they never should have existed to begin with. They were a corruption of God's original design and plan, done on purpose by rebellious fallen angels who intended to corrupt God's design and original plan. Um, so this this is obviously. Um, giving you a basis here but this is what the whole jesus coming was all about it was to correct this whole issue you know from the very beginning this corruption that happened so the elio and the nephil these lesser nephilim the the ones the children and the grandchildren of the nephilim throughout these four generations So you're basically saying they, sorry you're basically saying well, jesus was like patrick swayze in roadhouse like it was just out of control and they just sent him down like dude you gotta regulate this shit right boot <laughs> right like that's basically what the, he did he's like you so gotta funny, go dude. and clean this shit up dude jesus was patrick swayze in it, roadhouse Cleaning the place up. In a, in a style, yeah, sure. You know, if you want to stylize <laughs> it that way. But he also, like, oh, man, what show am I on? <laughs> this is the show. He also bro. gave us a way. Go on. No, no, I appreciate it. I get what you're saying. It, and people don't see Jesus in that way, you know what I mean? But in, in a way, that kind of is how it was. You know, he, he was there to put an end to the rebellion that happened before the flood from the angels. He even descends into hell. 
when he dies for three days and talks to the spirits of the angels who were cast into a prison during that time where they rebelled, you know. So the Nephilim were killed, but the angels, they can't die. So they were put into chains, into Tartarus, and they are set to be released in Revelations in the end times. You know, it says a pit will open up and a bad Apollyon will rise. Apollyon is basically a Zazel Semyaza, the leader of the Watchers who mated with human women. Um, so they're, no, they're in chains, but there are still rebellious angels about who didn't mate with human women, and they're still there running the agenda, which Lucifer is the head of. Lucifer didn't mate with any of these women either. You know, he's still free, roaming about doing his thing, running his rebellious agenda. So it didn't end just because the Nephilim were killed, but that, that part of the attempted plan to corrupt initial mankind was ended and obviously this is what the whole flood of noah is all about uh, noah was the last uncorrupted human being left all this intermingling had happened between cain's lineage and sethite lineage mm. nephilim with human women there were monsters running rampant in the last 120 years just before the flood it's described in the book of jasher that mankind through the help of fallen angels were taught how to mix genetic kinds together so they started mixing animals together that shouldn't be mixed together. They started mixing human beings with animals. Think of a siren or a mermaid or a centaur or these ancient myth mythological animals that are described in Greek culture, you know, these half human or half animal things. This is how they all came into creation. They were human beings who wanted to be like the Nephilim because being a human in that time and useless but being like a Nephilim-esque hybrid creature, if you can pick and choose the strengths of different animals to give you an advantage, then that was great for humans at the Damn, time. Damn, bro, and that's were, going on right now. Like, but going through Noah's right lineage. <laughs> yeah, Noah's lineage didn't do it. You know, they were the last ones left. And uh, that's what the, the Ark was for, is to preserve the last uncorrupted remnants of God's original creation, humans and animals alike. Um, and the flood did happen for that reason, and... The issue is it didn't fully wipe out the corruption. Now, this is very contentious among Christians because it says no, only Noah survived is what you're supposed to believe. Now, in a way, yes, Noah is the only true living being with God's willed soul within him alive, a truly alive being that survived. But there's plenty of accounts from other sources outside of the biblical perspective where Nephilim survived. You know, um, I can give you one story from Ecuador, completely far removed from the Middle East, as, as far as you can get. Um, in Ecuador, there's the Canary people. Okay, and the Canary people have a flood myth in which a flood came and two brothers survived by climbing to the top of an extremely tall mountain. Now, remember, all flesh was corrupted, if the Bible's correct. So these two brothers weren't human. They must have had something that gave them an edge and an ability to survive a flood. Maybe they had the gills of a fish or some kind of hardiness to them, which an animal trait they had chosen to corrupt themselves with, if the Bible's correct when it says all flesh was corrupted. Okay, so that alone, those two men surviving, that's another story of two men surviving a huge global deluge. But then they describe once the floodwaters disappear, two bird, half bird, half human women descend. What? And then these, these two men rape these bird Whoa. women <laughs> oh jesus oh, dear. Leave the <laughs> and they, the people of, alone oh, my God. the people of that area believe they are the descendants of the canary women and men of repopulated that entire area you know so there's an example of nephilim surviving the flood for example um you have obviously the famous story of um Zuizudra surviving the flood um, through the help of Enki and Enlil in the uh, Mesopotamian flood myth. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh describes this. Um, people try and argue, well, that's just where the Noah myth comes from. That's just a copy. The Noah myth copied that, you know. But they're not talking about the same characters. Uh, the the character who was saved by Enlil and Enki in the um, Epic of Gilgamesh story was actually a documented law king of a city called Larsa which was the last king of the antediluvian age before the flood. And it seems like Watcher-class angels came to this king, who was a Nephilim. He was the quintessential tyrannical Nephilim ruler king. All kingships were run by Nephilim by that point. So what we, that story really is, is a story that happened at the same time as Noah being made to survive. And his boat wasn't an ark, it was a cube of some kind. It was a different dimension. Um, he was given immortality after the flood, apparently. Um, Noah wasn't given no Im immortality after the flood. <laughs> you know, the, the completely different stories about different people surviving the flood from different perspectives, basically. So, um, so over the weekend when I met with El Dorado, 
he said something that really resonated with me, which was that the Bible is the story of Israel and that there is other things going on in the world at this time, but this is a specific story about this specific area during this specific time. So this resonates with me, what you're saying, and that conversation I had with him resonates with me because, again, like I was telling him in our conversations, El Dorado, is that, you know, when the woman who came in and talked about the Black Madonna, I go, this is all possible. Because that was a different region of mm. Earth. Like, we have the story yeah. of that, this area, Israel, or wherever Israel is at this time, okay? What was going on in China? What was going on in Africa? What was going on in Latin America? These are different moments in time. So, like, this resonates with me. Yeah. Well, I I'm going to get into what was happening in all those places. Yeah, <laughs> and this is what bro. my people is all together, basically, with the whole Nephilim look like clowns thing. You find that what sounds like a trivial, silly subject actually covers everything and every base for a reason. Because my my work is actually a study of all these folk traditional cultures around the world who still venerate the Nephilim today and have done for thousands of years with these ancient ritualistic practices. And what they happen to do is dress like the thing to evoke the thing and be possessed by the thing. And what they're dressing like are the Nephilim, which are now the disembodied spirits, which we call demons today. So this was a major consequence of of the battles of the Nephilim, which wiped the initial ones out, and the flood, which wiped out a lot more, including the corrupted humans who also had committed the ultimate sin, basically. You don't just corrupt your flesh and your soul leaves unharmed. It's all connected, okay? They're not separate things. They work in tandem with each other. And the people who I've coined the phrase Nephilimified themselves they also became disembodied spirits and suffered the same fate as the original Nephilim that were created from angels mating with human women. And the curse is, you know, they they die, but their spirits live on and they become demons that we call today the disembodied wandering spirits. Yes. They wander, wander in dry places and, and they hunger and thirst and have no means to satisfy those hunger or thirst because they don't have a body to experience sensations with. And they're kind of stuck in a state of perpetual hell in that in that respect, you know, constant pain and suffering. And the only thing they desire from now on since that moment of disembodiedness is another body to experience the fleshly pleasures once more, you know, to get all hellraiser about it and weird. But that's kind of how they see the world and why that's the whole point of possession and the phenomena of possession. Damn, it's these... bro, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And this is why we needed Jesus, because what does he do? But he comes to cast out demons and offer us a way of protecting ourselves from them. That was him finally putting an end to the scourge of the demonic kind of infestation through humanity. And because they are this is, all this is... subject to Jesus. They all are. Exactly. Jesus. It, so when Jesus like, come out and show yourself, they all had to come out and show themselves. They, yeah. have, no, they have no power, yeah. And, that is uh, the rule. Jesus. Yeah, I've mentioned they that beg. before, that when it, Jesus, it seems in the Bible, people possessed with demons were the only ones that m immediately recognized him. You know, it, it, you, that's, that happens a couple of times. It, he, yeah. Whenever he comes up to a human, they're like, not possessed. You know, they're like, who are you? You know, what's your deal? Yeah, yeah, But yeah. anytime he sees somebody possessed with demons, they're like, I know who you are. Yeah, like, what are you oh, doing shit. here? Leave us alone. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, they're terrified. Uh because they, Most like you said, they don't want to be cast out. And they're saying something like, is it time already? <laughs> it's like, I thought I had longer. That's the demons are saying. You Isn't know? that interesting? You finally That's come so interesting. That's so, in you know, when I listen to this and I was thinking about this the other day after my conversation with El Dorado, I was just like, you know, it's so many people dismiss the Bible and I'm, we're going to get, we're going to get a lot of love, but we're going to get tons of people telling us crazy, you know, just poo pooing. Right, poo poo. -ing. Imagine listening to all the other stuff we talk about, and then having a problem with this. But so, but what I, mean? I, what I saw, what I think is super interesting, is that you know it's like people love Harry Potter, people love Game of Thrones, people love all that stuff, and you're like, this sounds way better than that stuff. Like if someone did a proper version of the Nephilim in a in a action series, that'd be <laughs> so badass. Jesus well, comes Rob down Steven. with a mullet. We should get Mel Gibson on that, dude. Bro, Mel Gibson on, could probably bro. play the Nephilim. Let's do it. You're right. Mel Gibson. I don't Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Whatever. There's a guy.
Bieber, who who actually was part of the the culture of conspiracy in this realm, talking about the Nephilim for years. He did start making an animated series. He had the pilot going and everything and a crew, oh. and he called it Seed Wars. Um, oh, what? And he he called it Seed Wars. Um, but he's he's dead now. <laughs> he he was put on a ventilator and died during the whole COVID. What? War. Damn. Tough. Yeah. So shame, you know, that that happened. But he was trying to tell the story, um, and maybe maybe you're not allowed. You know, who knows? If you want to get all conspiratorial about it. Guys, I want to tell you about our friends at Babbel. I love Babbel. I use Babbel. Let me tell you about Babbel. As you know, I want to speak multiple languages. So when I'm just roaming the lands using Krav Maga Jiu-Jitsu Thai boxing to just basically lock stuff down like a Ronin, okay, I'm going to need to be able to talk to different people in different languages, okay? I'll probably I'll lose XG at some point with his bad knees, so I won't have him there to speak Spanish, okay? So... Uh, I'm going I want you guys to hear about Babbel. Now, why why Babbel to learn a language? Well, because Babbel works. It's that simple. Instead of paying hundreds of dollars for a private tutor or fooling yourself with language apps that are a little more than just a game, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in less than 3 weeks. Guys, I didn't even know there were 150 languages. I thought there was like 4. <laughs> right? I mean, it's that amazing. So Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. All of Babbel's tips and tools are, are for learning a new language that are approachable, accessible, rooted in real life, and delivered with conversational-based teachings, okay? I love doing it, all right? I love speaking Spanish. I want to learn that, and eventually I'd like to learn a couple other languages. I'm trying I spend a little time every day trying to go deep, okay? Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. For instance, one study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to one full semester of college. With over 10 million subscribers sold, Babbel is a real language learning for real conversation. So here's what's special. Okay, for a limited time deal, okay, for our listeners to get... You started right now. Get 55% off. That's a double nickel off, okay? Your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash tinfoil. Get 50% off babbel.com slash tinfoil, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash tinfoil. Rules and restrictions may apply. But I, I'm going to tell you the story now verbally. Let, let's round that off so we can get onto the clown stuff. It's like, I think please get... shut up and let me finish the story. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. No. <laughs> stuff. It's, no, it's all good, story, dude. You know? It's all good. I, I, it's all good. Go on for it. Go for it. You know, it's embodied the dead. A lot of them died during the flood as well. That kind of reset everything. It got rid of all the kingships and the infrastructure that was established by the Nephilim and the, um, the fallen angels. So they had to start from scratch, you know. Some of them may have survived, but they were in no way in the position of rulership and dominance they once were. That was kind of... So the flood was a success in that respect. And obviously Noah repopulated the earth and um, there were pockets of nephilim repopulating around as well at the same time and then as time goes on and you fold the lineages down you, you see that most of the nephilim that have survived and also been repopulating have congregated in canaan a land called canaan okay and that's what most of the post-flood old testament stories are about it's about retaking those lands back from the giants the sons of anak as they're described the zamzamines the emims they have there's, there's many tribes there and the, the story is of god choosing a people um which are the, what we call the israelites uh, israel um, you know god's people and he he could he could have chosen anyone essentially but he chose obviously one that had a pure lineage obviously from noah downwards and they were rebellious. They, they were constantly sacrificing to idols, going against his word, believing in one minute, then rebelling against him another minute. But he stuck with them. He made a choice. You know? And he basically molds these people that live in this this satanic world still, you know, full of idol worship and Nephilim worship from the Tower of Babel onwards, you know, with trying to reach the, you know, that that happened not long after the flood, you know, Nimrod trying to create a tower to heaven, probably trying to recreate a similar scenario that happened before the flood where the angels can mate with women again, you know, <laughs> trying to Nephilimify the world, trying to help the Nephilim that were already around, you know, 
it seems like Nimrod was really into the Nephilim, like he wanted to be one, and he also worked with them and helped the ones that were ar- were around. It's very strange, but the point is that the Nephilim were there and they needed wiping out. That was a part of the plan of God. You know, we're going to wipe this scourge off the earth. So he raised a peoples to do that. And these people did through miracle after miracle, defeat these giants, just slaughtered them, you know, and these giants who heard that these normal sized people were coming after them and winning. I imagine a lot of them fled you know, <laughs> through fear that God's retribution was finally catching up with them. And there are stories you know, all around the earth of pockets of Nephilim that seem to still be around. You know, it wasn't all just happening in the Middle East, even though a lot of them had congregated there. And the stories of giants surviving all the way up into the North Pole through Americas as well. There's a lot of stories of giants in America and the mound builders, you know, the uh, the red-headed giants of Lovelock Cave and the city car giants. Uh, the giants who decimated the Duwamish tribes. Um, I can I can tell you all those stories later, but um, the majority of them were wiped out, you know, in Canaan by God's people, and that land was reclaimed. Uh, David and Goliath is kind of the the last remnants of the giants that were left. That's the most famous story that a lot of people know about. But he was like one of the last of like the five giants who remained, basically. Um, but I think a lot of giants did flee that area during that time and settle all around the earth. So some remnants still survived, but now they're literally in hiding because it seems like wherever the Nephilim get encounter with humans, they don't win. It seems to be kind of like the God-given edict against them that uh, they, they they can either choose to fight or hide. If you fight, you die. If you hide, you get to live a boring, horrible life, basically. A lot of them have chosen that, you know to live underground or in caves or in places uninhabitable by normal humans. Uh, There's one amazing example I discovered during my research um, of the Tunit tribe, um, which is um, the Eskimo people, basically, in in that region of of North America, you know, the Inuit tribes. They talk about this this other tribe, this mysterious tribe of giants called the Tunits that were around, that they ended up wiping out because they were encroaching on their hunting grounds. But the tunic were described as being about 10 foot, not eight to 10 foot. And they could basically sling a seal over their shoulder, no problem. You know what I mean? They could run extreme speeds. They had a, a insane strength. But the funny thing is, you know, they they always ran away whenever the humans encountered them. They didn't stick around to fight, basically. And like I said, when they did fight, they knew where people slaughtered them. They were gone, you know. So it seemed like they knew the deal. Get us get as far away from humanity as we possibly can. Let's go as far north into the icy regions that are uninhabitable by people. And then as soon as people turned up, they ran away. <laughs> Basically, that's the story of the Tunia people. They kept running, um, but they didn't escape the fate. They were wiped out inevitably. Do you um, um, have you heard of the have you heard of the redheaded giant of Afghanistan? The yeah, the, the Kandahar giant. What, what yeah. do you think of that story? I, th- I think it's probably legit. I think that's probably the case. I think a lot of the, like I said, a lot of them did go into hiding and may have continued into the present day. And their lifespans are not like ours. You know, I do think they live a lot longer and they uh, can survive a lot longer. And uh, I mean, I'm going to get into this, but if you look into, for example, um, Europe, European traditions of the wild man, it you know, people were said to be encountering during medieval times, extremely tall, hairy, beast-like men and women you know, who lived dwelt in forest areas, remnants of these bloodlines of the Nephilim do still exist. Now, obviously, the true original Nephilim, the big tall ones, you know, that were first created, don't exist anymore. We'd see one of them a mile away, literally, you know. Um, but the, the the lesser bloodlines that have diluted into the, the earth today, you know, through corrupted humans and obviously interbreeding with humans, they still exist. And this is... Um, why we have a conspiracy of elites who want to control us. They believe they are the people with the bloodline that goes back to the original Nephilim. They believe the Nephilim are their ancestors, you know, and that's why we have secret societies. That's what this, that's what they're trying to protect. That's the bloodlines they believe they have. That's why royals believe they have the divine right to rule and the blue blood, the royal blood. It all goes back to this serpentine race that they believe they're a part of. And, um, you find that, for example, in, in the Inca uh, traditions and all over America, these mounds are everywhere, which were said to be built by giants, by the natives that are around there. 
Uh, people have been digging up bones since the 18th, uh, 19th century, finding giants all over the place. And the Smithsonian always turns up, takes the bones away, and no one ever sees them ever again or hears about it ever again. Um, the evidence for the giants was everywhere, and it's kind of just been occulted and hidden from us. But I do believe the bloodlines are still around today. You Absolutely. say they are. Is there any way they're like... a? Uh underground or in the grand canyon the spots that are forbidden do you think there's a community of them around or you think they're just one here one there just scattered everywhere i think there's organized groups there's scattered groups i think there's levels of intelligence um some are more brutish and animalistic than others i think it's uh, just as complicated as human society you know i think it's a whole world that kind of lives alongside ours speaking Um, of speaking of the world what do you think of the nature of the world because i know some people out there who believe the earth is flat might believe that possibly these giants are hiding uh you know beyond beyond the wall i mean it's possible yeah well it's possible Uh, again i I try not to get bogged down in that kind of stuff because it makes people weird (laughs) yeah yeah. but i i I'm open to the idea. I, I I believe we have been lied to about the nature of the cosmology of the Earth. I don't know for certain what it is exactly. There's multiple ideas and concepts of which could work, you know. Uh, but I do I do know the narrative we've been told is probably false. That's where I kind of stand on that. Right on. Um, I, I, I don't want to say with any authority what it is or isn't. And so so it's, it's, this bloodline you think is based on Nephilim? Is that what you're saying? These royals have Nephilim bloodline or is it like reptilian bloodline? Well, the one in the same, which is what we'll get to now. Okay, let's um, go. So let's go. About what the Nephilim looks like. Um, so we know a few things. Okay. So we know, first of all, that they are the offspring of fallen angels, which were seraphim class angels. They were serpentine angels. Now, if we look at the book of Amran, which is a book found in the Qumran cave with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's actually a vision um, from Moses's father, I think it was, um, written in that book, where he actually encounters Lucifer and another angel as well. Um, I think it's Michael it's supposed to be. And they're both described specifically Lucifer, who's named Bela Lyle in that book, but it's the same name. You can find it. that It's been used as synonymous with Lucifer himself. Um, he's described as having a face like a viper and skin like an adder. So he has black and white fractal patterned serpent skin with a large, wide mouth grin, serpent mouth, pointy eyes. Sounds like Voldemort, looked, honestly. Uh, sounds yeah, like Lord Voldemort. he has a... He, ha- he looks like a snake, you know, um, like a human snake hybrid, basically. Wasn't he supposed uh, so to be beautiful? Isn't, isn't Haven't we heard that? That he's beautiful? Who, Lucifer? He's supposed to be. Yeah, Luc- Lucifer was a beautiful, described as a beautiful angel. He was made perfect in the eyes of God. He was second to God in terms of class and ranking of the angels. There's a hierarchy to the angels, you know. And Seraphim are right there next to the throne of God. They are the second in command, you know. And then next to them is the cherubim. Um, Ezekiel describes the, the cherubim as being, um, the living animals or the living creatures. They have like the head of a lion, a goat, and all sorts of things mashed together with wings. Then you have the chariots that they ride upon, which are like circles, wheels within wheels, coated in eyes. Have you ever seen that image of the biblically accurate angels that goes around on social media, where it's just eyes all, all over everything? And oh. it's inter- like really, that's basically where that comes from. It comes from Ezekiel, that description, that vision of the angels. Um, but just above them are the seraphim, which have six wings that hide the face and everything about them um, <laughs> because of the glory of God, right, that the wings protect them, basically. But when they're on Earth, when the wings are unfurled, they have serpentine, snake-like features. And that's why they're called the seraphim. Seraph what? is a Hebrew word. Which, which of these would you up. say is, is the one you're talking about here? You, the one you, at the top, the big, up there. This one here? No. This? All of, no. This? Mom, nope. Up. You know? Up that, that one. one. Six wings, right? <laughs> but I thought he said something yes. covered in eyes, right? Where, where? Look at all the eyes. That white one there, the top um, the top right. That's the one that goes popular on social. That oh, one there. Okay. That's, that's what that's angels kind of look like? Whoa, oh, that's not... So, yeah. so that not, is some creepy-ass shit, uh, man. So, so when, when Gabriel appears to... Mary, this is what he sees, or she sees, rather. And that's why they always say, you know, first thing they say is fear not. <laughs> I see. Try not to calm down. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> that makes total but, uh, sense now. Dude, going back to Godzilla movies, that looks like half the people Godzilla fought. 
I really don't. There's different angels though with different visages. Uh, the lower class angels do look more human, um, but the higher ones next. They they look like this. They are weird looking things. What, what is now, the reason for that? Do you reckon that that the lower class ones look more human? Is that because they interact with humans more? It's functional, or is there some other reason? And yeah, they're kind of like um, messengers on a, on a human level, on an earthly level, more than anything. These things have uh, have rulership rules. You know, these things are something else. I mean, I think the cherubim uh, can't really move from their allotted position because they're said to hold up the firmament. Do you oh, get what I mean? They all have yeah. kind of a role to play in creation. Uh, ex exactly. I'm not saying they helped God create it, but they have like a mechanistic rule or role to play within it. That's why like um, the wandering stars or stars, for example, are described as actually being angels who are putting their allotted place. The wandering stars are those who rebelled against God and decided to leave their allotted space, you know? Yeah. So creation itself is kind of uh, this spiritual thing in which angels interact with it and help in wow. the process of making happen you know but uh, it's all obviously created by god essentially um and the seraphim themselves are, are supposed to basically be there to glorify god continuously and that's what they do they constantly sing and glorify god lucifer was said to be the first musician you know he played like no other basically he was ordained in gold and you know he had his own throne himself you know he was he was loved by, by god basically kind of like a son you know in a way um, but he rebelled basically and came down to earth. And it seems like in human, on a human level, they're always described in, in cultures outside of biblical canon, you know, as feathered, fiery serpents. Damn, and that bro. makes sense. That, Dude, you know what's so funny that is that uh, oh. Lucifer has bad bunny vibes. Anybody with me on that one? <laughs> yeah. Just really bad bunny vibes. <laughs> like, just like thinks he's good looking, jamming, doing weird shit. This is bad vibes, bad. Bad vibes. Bad. Bad vibes. Bad influence. But that's crazy because you're telling me that these angels had like fiery, feathered. But what do we say about dinosaurs? That they think dinosaurs were all feathered up, right? Like it's like super interesting. It's fascinating, yeah. It's a thought. Yeah, well, I, I do think they 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 did create beings like that, which we could call dinosaurs today. You know, which is why we have remnants of these fossils everywhere. I do think the earth became incredibly corrupted when the mixing of kinds happened and giant reptiles were a part of that, you know. You find obviously in China, for example, dragon symbolism is everywhere. In in all most of Asia Asia, it's dragons galore. Yeah, yeah. Um and obviously then you go over to the Americas and the, the feathered serpent is, was the main god. And there's many names for the feathered serpent actually across America. I wrote it down earlier, if I can just quickly get it up. Um let's go to South American. That's fascinating. Yeah, it, it is, honestly. Um, so the, the feathered serpent is a prominent supernatural entity or deity found in many Mesoamerican religions. It's called Quetzalcoatl in the Aztecs. Oh, yeah. It's called Kukul among the Yucatec Maya. And it's called Kukumat and Tohil among the Kichimaya. So feathered serpents were everywhere in the ancient world, basically. And they were the gods of the time. And people bowed down and worshipped them. Whoa. And they're always described. Have these analogies where they say you know um father sky came down and mated with mother earth to create these beings you know and that's basically angels coming down and mixing with human women to create nephilim they all have their own kind of poetic way of telling the same stories um, but the feathered serpents were the angels basically and that's exactly how they're described in the biblical text of the book of amran as well they were and that's why they're called seraphim seraph is means the burning of a snake's bite of a venom what? um Therefore, is what the angels are. They are fiery, burning, serpent-like beings. Um, so imagine that mixing with a daughter of Cain, which may have had a porcelain white skin as to the curse and the mark of Cain and the lineage of Cain. Um, what you're going to get is some kind of strange amalgam hybrid of a human serpent type being with porcelain white skin and wild, fiery red hair. Um, that's your base there. That's the baseline mainstream understanding of what a Nephilim would look like if you were to just mash those two things together. And what my work has basically done is I've explored folk traditional cultures all around the world, uh, artwork, the masks that they were, um, the artwork that they've created, the clothes that they were during their invocation rituals. And you'll find that they always depict them in the same way. They always have a huge, wide smile. 
these are the ancestor spirits that they're referring to, or, or literally they call them demons themselves. Uh, they always have the similar features, a huge wide smile, often with fangs coming from the bottom and the top in a curved like manner. And they have white skin and red hair. It's always the same. It's always the same pattern. No matter, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, you will find the same thing. Um, now, one major example, just, just to settle this idea that the Nephilim did have clan-like features just from the get-go. This is a good one to go to. Oh, you shit, can Google it. bro. That just, like, you just hit me with that shit. <laughs> Damn, bro. <laughs> yeah, so you can Google it now and type in Wand Gina of the Aborigine culture of Australia. Type in the Wand Gina. So W-A-N-D-J-I-N-A. So this is a creature that is supposedly created during the dream time this is the aboriginal dream time they refer it it's a time way before time okay when things were weird and trippy what they're describing is the antediluvian age when serpentine like beings were around everywhere mixing with humans and humans worship them like gods and they describe the serpents not as feathered serpents but as rainbow serpents because of how the multicolored crazy patterns they had all over their skin and the supernatural beings that they were. Now, the offspring of the rainbow serpents were these Wanginas, as they're described as thunder and rain gods of some kind. But they were physical entities. And it said when they died, they crawled into a cave and they painted an image of themselves on the walls. So you can type in Wangina rock art and you'll see it. Somebody do something. I, I, you're doing it, right, actually? Mm -hmm. are, you, up, yeah. are we trusting as she to spell? He spelled it though. The guy spelled it. J -I w A N W A I N A W A W N D. Okay, start from the I beginning. Right, yeah, this yeah, is his second it. language, so just take him. It got go cut slow. off, but Johnny got it. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's uh, like a one. There it is. That's the one genome creature. So uh, just type a Google image search of it. Um, All right. All right. You'll get most prominent images. Whoa. So there you go. Uh, for example, Google image search and you'll find what they do. These are sacred sites to the aboriginals. So what they do every year is they repaint over to make sure they continue to the modern age. But look at what they are. They're white skinned, bright, glowing, blue eyed yeah. and with a red halo like a clown wig. Whoa. And these, and these ones... These ones are even depicted as having the typical clown collar on them, if you look closely. And their clothing or skin is polka dot, like a clown costume. This is probably the closest I've found to a serpentine snake god offspring looking identical to a clown oh. while looking at folk. You're yeah. totally right. Look at that. That looks like a clown. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. So this is this is what one example I've, I've discovered which is hits the point straight away you know it's the most on the nose version i've found um and that's what these creatures were you know and they were considered giants among men gods among men at the time the the physical foot soldiers of the of the heavenly snake entities not a lot of angels. not a lot of strong drawers in the old days you know not a lot of great <laughs> sketch artists in these old days here. <laughs> there was clearly a lot of them if you look at somehow how they've done it and this one is yeah. interesting because it has the big nose as well you know, and they've really oh, got yeah. it all out with the clown. Dude, it, that it, is crazy, they have trouble. Bro. They struggle with perspective, though, in these older pieces. It's interesting because... <laughs> Don't they look like a but, like a type of gray to you in any way? Like an alien, and one yeah, of those type of yeah, alien grays? Totally. You could see, though, you, what I'm saying about the perspective, you could see this is meant to be kind of coming at you, but they're not quite sure how to place it. It really should probably be coming down for perspective, but it's interesting. Well... The, the, the theory goes that these were painted on the rock walls as like a self-portrait before they died. Oh, wow. The, they say that's why they're on there. But, you know, these are so old. Who, who, you know, who knows why they're actually there? And they <laughs> got, look at that. What looks like their mouth also looks like a red clown nose. Oh, I think that's the nose. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be, right? It's said that these beings didn't have mouths because if they did speak, they would destroy the earth. <laughs> that's what they believe. Wow. Um, like noise that would come out of them would be so powerful that it would just cause ruptures through space and time so they don't have a mouth. That's Something what they say God about these. That is so That's something you've heard about God crazy, too, right? Hearing the voice of God. Dude. Melt your so brain. Yeah. crazy. That but I'll show enough. you, a few, I'll give you a few other examples from cultures all over the earth. Um, on, so that, that's, that's it's the most on the nose. Wan John Ja. What Wan is it called? Wangina? Wangina, yeah. Wand. 
They also had other creatures called the uh, the Mimis in the same area. The um, Mimis? The uh, Mimis? The, I have a Mimi. My, um, <laughs> Love her. Oh, is that your grandma? Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Aww. And they have long serpentine long bodies and they were very, they were like very weird. And they also have betrayed with huge, big, wide grins, like a Joker type jester entity. Um, the, yeah, that's Australia. Australia is a trippy place. You know, <laughs> everything about their traditions are really trippy and weird. And Can we get a spelling on that one? Because I, I don't, I'm, I'm How do you spell that? M- M-I-M-I. M-I-M-I. Uh, M-I-M-I. Mimi. Type it Aboriginal artwork. Isn't that, isn't that what, what was that one baseball player called memes? Was he's like, you know, they're going to get out there and do one of those memes, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Bryce Harper. That. It was somebody like that, yeah. Uh, here, here we go. Okay. The meme. Whoa! That's wild looking. Yeah. And they're on a, they're on older rock artwork as well, but they're basically a human snake hybrid. You know, um, big like long Slender Man. Yeah, like Slender Man. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Whoa, bro. That is creepy. This guy's got like a, like a stinger or a. Yeah, he's got something <laughs> going on there. Boner. No wonder they made it with women. Look at that. That fucking brute, bro. Oh, I like this. Yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That's why I did in a cartoon of it. That's funny. <laughs> wow, but, dude. Let's try. Let's try a different culture. Let's go to um, Asia and India. Is quite a, quite a good one as well. Let's uh, let's see what I've got here. So, um, are these supposed to be evil or not evil? Is there a reason we're scared of clowns? Or some people are very terrified of clowns. Great it's, question, yeah. Xavier Guerrero. Ooh, coming well, back. Well, ooh, ooh. can't spell, Welcome but great to question. The <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Horophobia is the fear of clowns, and it does seem like it's innate within us, with, within a lot of people, to just have a natural oh, distaste or just. Oh, Perhaps it is, you know, it's it's kind of in our genes now. Maybe yeah. it is like that, you know, maybe ingrained into us like an instinct to be repulsed by them or scared of them. Because remember, these things were cannibals. You know, these things were eating people. You know, we had very we were their prey you know friend that's enough to leave an um, emotional scar on the collective psyche of humanity i think certainly <laughs> um so it's, it's, it's fun to theorize but I couldn't, I couldn't say for certain on that but yeah it does seem like the fear of clowns is is a well-established fear you know it's understood as as common it's a common one i wouldn't say it's a rare fear in any way shape or form i mean if you look up sh- uh, the sri lankan raksha demon so if you go to sri lanka and type the in what? r-a-k S H A. Oh, I see. Okay, Raksha. R A S H A. The Raksha demon, um, from Sri Lanka. And these masks, the, the this is what they wear during the invocation rituals. Um, and this is their representation of of a similar snake human hybrid thing. And you'll find these to be incredibly monstrous and trippy. That looks like Quetzalcoatl. Yeah, but this is a completely different culture. This is the other side of the world. Let's bear that in mind. Uh, you'll find that there are these archetypical threads running through all of them. They all have the same features, and you'll find the tongue sticking out is extremely common. These big, wide grimaces with bizarre tusk teeth sticking out, extremely large, bulging eyes as well. Uh, so this is like a human snake that's been melded together, basically. Human features, snake features mashed together. Wow. And you get something like... So this wild thing here with snake for hair you know serpentine like hair um now let's go look at medusa for example in greece type in the gorgon in greek in greek mythology just gorgon yeah now what we remember i've been told is it's the snake head woman but that's actually a very modern interpretation of, of medusa she doesn't actually have snake for hair on the older depictions of her uh, she actually has red dreadlocks so bright red hair pale white skin with a tongue sticking Whoa. out. Oh! Thanks as well. And she has wings more often than not, just like her parents would have, which were the seraphim angels. Um, she is a snake human hybrid. She is a Nephilim creature. Um, and there you go. That's what she looks like. Very human ish with snake like visages. And you'll find that Gorgon esque face with the tongue sticking out is everywhere, all over the earth when depicting demons in different cultures they always tend to look like this it doesn't matter what culture you go to they have their own stylistic way of depicting it but it's always with this yeah the japanese have something that looks just like that those japanese demons or the 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 food dogs 
the they food have dogs? the food dogs. Sounds like a gang. The food dogs. Yeah, you're the food, food dogs. dogs. They have um, a lion and a dog. Yeah, um, but you find the only demons look very similar to this um, in Japanese and Chinese culture. Um, you'll find on the center of the Aztec calendar, you have the same creature there sticking its tongue out. Kali is another great example of this in Indian culture where she has her tongue sticking out with blue skin and the fangs. Um, this yeah, gorgon oh, yeah, so wow. I remember our history here. These things were kings and rulers of the antediluvian age. They were worshipped as gods, you know, so that's why they're... They're everywhere. And you'll find that um, cultures who venerate them to this day, they call them ancestor spirits. They don't refer to them as Nephilim. They don't see them from the Christian perspective. Mm. They believe they are the progenitors of their culture. They are the, the ancestors. And what do they call the spirit. them? They call them ancestor spirits. So there's this whole thing around the world in Africa, in India, uh, every continent. It doesn't matter where you go. The folk traditions, what they do is partake in the invocation and veneration of ancestor spirits but what that basically means translates into biblical english is they basically allow themselves to get possessed by the demonic spirits of nephilim that's basically what they're doing by dressing up like them so they have this understanding what did you just say dude did you just say these people dress like that in hopes of getting possessed by spirits yes holy that's shit it. That you know what that's that does? Exact- that makes me afraid of ayahuasca now. Like that, it might be because that the same in the same culture you know generated that that ceremony. I wonder. Or how if about it's- Halloween? Are we allowing like for dark forces in by dressing up like fucking hookers? What do you think? Is there well, this- is, is there a risk to ayahuasca and those kinds of things? What do you? But the shamans are the ones who are usually the designated individual to take the spirit into them to communicate to the rest of the tribe. The shamans are the designated medium, they call them. And yes, the shaman often dresses in psychedelic colored clothing and usually a wide brimmed hat as well, which we'll get into, which is a huge part of this. Um, They often have like feathers attached to them with multicolored ribbons as well. Uh, It's usually the common pattern when you look across cultures and shamanism, they always dress in a very similar fashion because they are the ones that are going to channel the spirit. And then obviously usually the tribe communicates with the spirit for advice or power or something of of that kind. And that's in some cultures, they do that. Other cultures, anybody and anybody can get possessed by the spirit as long as they dress in a specific way and do enough tribal music. Africa is rife with ancestor spirit worship. Um, there's, There's too many tribes to actually tell you. Um, but they all basically look the same and dress in the same way. If you type in ancestor spirit worship Africa and just type in ritual or something with that word, you'll find hundreds of examples of the, the, the dress and garb that they would wear. And it's incredibly psychedelic. It's like something out of the DMT realm itself. Um, so Africa is huge on it. You know, most of their religions are based in this ancestor spirit worship. And it's not grandma and granddad. It's not their aunties and uncles. Okay, it's they are worshiping the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, and then they know what they're doing. You know, they, for example, that one that says, "When the ancestors dance," I see that one quite a lot. Um, these masks that they're wearing, they are wearing with the sole intention to be possessed by the spirits. Um, the ones often you see them with the huge hairy bodies that are made of straw, for example. They will dance in those and wave it round so they become kind of like a blur. I think that is to represent the disembodied nature of the spirit now being ethereal in a sense. Um, and is this benign? Do you think this is benign? Sorry, do or is this is this is this dangerous and negative and dark? Uh, very dangerous. Okay. Um, I think I think being ignorant of the Lord doesn't make you safe from the law type of thing. Now, what you'll find very interesting is in Europe we have a different viewpoint on this. Okay, everywhere else around the world understands that you dress like the thing to attract the thing, but for some reason in in European countries that have been dominated by Catholic kind of uh, ritualistic ideas. Um, you'll find they have this other view where, no, 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 you dress like the thing to scare away the thing. We have this other twisted about it. I think we're wrong. So I think we've got it wrong. Can you, can you cite an example of that? I'm not, I don't quite recall. It, it, well, I mean, I was so, about to ask, is that why like the Catholic, Halloween, is, that is that why the Catholic priest dresses like that? A little weird and stuff? What do you mean? <laughs> so, like, you know how the Catholic uh, priest has a costume? Is it a, is it's there, like a suit? What do you mean? They just wear a suit with that little collar. What? No, they don't. A Catholic priest. I, don't oh, they? A Catholic oh, priest. What do you? I don't know what you're. You're talking about like the Pope. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know I about do, that. 
outfit is based on the Dogen fish god worship with the mitre hat, which is the fit fish hat, if you want to get into that, um, which is, a, is a, obviously a, an ancient Nephilim deity. But uh, if, out of that, one example I can give you about the Vatican is the Swiss guard of the Vatican dress like jesters, if you haven't noticed. Oh, interesting. With the red. Let's see. They have a red feather in the hair as well with, on the helmet, the bright red hair, which is a Nephilim trait with multicolored clothing as well. So the guard of the, you know, the Swiss guard of the Vatican's, they do dress in a Nephilim esque fashion. Yeah. Oh, they look ridiculous. <laughs> God, they are, like, you know, of Rome. So it's, there's something to be said about maybe. Um, but you'll find a. Uh, Hold the cookery on, bro. Are you trying to say they're dressing like the Nephilim? Yep. In a sense. Whether they know it or not. I would Whoa. Say. And Whether not, yeah. Oh, and they're the Swiss? The <laughs> Swiss are out of where, Johnny? I'm sorry. Swiss are out of Switzerland? And it's not yeah, that. Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I don't Swiss. know. I don't, I don't know what that means. Though. It may just be an Swiss, honorary Swiss sort of title. The Vatican. Huh? Let's look it up right here. Yeah, dude, at the Switzerland, which where is the center of all. Right, but they're at the Vatican. I don't. They may be Italian people. I don't know how that works. Let me see. Uh, they're Italian people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're they Italian. Too. Also, don't forget, uh, Catholicism goes all throughout Europe, so it's like a an amalgam band of cultures together under the band of Catholic, isn't it? So, uh, you know, oh, they're, they're from all over oh, the place. Okay. They're Swiss Catholic they're, males. Yeah. Okay. They're an Re army. Recruits to the guards must be an unmarried Swiss Catholic males between 18 and 30 uh, who have completed basic training in the Swiss armed forces. And then I guess they get if you brought to... Speaking of Switzerland, if you type in uh, Bas Basler Fasnach, so I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but it's B-A-S-L-E-R, Basler Fasnach. And it's B the... B -A -S -S the Could you give me that again? I'm sorry. L E R B A S L E R Basler, yeah, okay, fast snatch. B -A -S. Oh, I see it right there. Okay, the Fos festival of Basel, Basler, fast, which I think is how you would say, it. and uh, you'll find what they dress oh, like. Oh, what is this? The fuck are we watching now? What Look the at these guys. Yeah, so fuck is that? <laughs> these are the giants that they're representing. So this is where you're talking about possibly in the the, the Hold west. On. Is we Shrek dress like the a thing. Nephilim. <laughs> That's but, but they dress like the thing during Lent period before the fasting period. So it's been uh, Catholicized and they believe that they are doing this to ward away all the evil spirits before the beginning of the fast. You know, I love it. she doesn't um, participate at all. She's just like, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yeah. Well, fine, the, the combination they have to represent the demons are clowns. That's what they go for. Oh, uh, yeah. They, so Dude, it's always these large. Insane. Look at that one up there. Yeah, that, that one looks is like the, most the guy from no. Saw, dude. That looks like the guy from mm -hmm. Saw. The one above with the big red nose. Oh. That's the most common one you find. That's oh, that the kind looks of the so goat. much like those carvings that you showed us a few minutes ago with the upturned that's, nose. That's what the Nephilim would have looked like. Yeah, big, wide, wide serpentine smiles, uh, sharp teeth, bulging eyes, big red noses. Seems to be extremely common. And they were mating. With, and they were mating with females. Yeah, which means well, these are, chicks will hook up with anything. Who would give it up to that? Right. I mean, well, maybe not all the choice, <laughs> to be honest, from the sounds of it. Um, well, it's just like this, women love bad boys, and there's no bigger bad boy than fallen demons, dude. <laughs> fallen angels. It's my joke. It's, fine, a, it's great. Yeah. Wow. So there's just some, just some quick examples. I have hundreds uh, all on my channel. You can go and see them. But let's let's just talk about the clown. Let's let's break a clown down. Okay. So oh, fundamentally, oh. white skin, red hair, two prime Nephilim traits. Everywhere you've that's been Nephilim have been described throughout history. They usually have wild red hair and white skin. Um, now clowns are often depicted with a big wide smile with red lips okay i think that's a mix of having a human form with red lips and look how red my lips are right now for example that's not something a serpent would normally have but because they had the human essence added to it they had a big wide serpent smile with human red lips so it looked pretty creepy and weird you know but not only that i've also theorized it could possibly be a reference to a blood around the mouth because they were cannibals so when clowns oh. have a big red smile mm. they may be trying to represent that when they when they do it so i'll get into how this is done on purpose soon there's a conspiracy to all this and where we get a modern clown from which i will explain but let's explain first the clown itself so we know what we're talking about for context so white skin a nephilim canine trait of the humans who first mated with them um wild red hair a trait of the fallen angels the fiery seraphim serpents the big wide smile a serpent trait picked up from the seraphim angels who mated with human women they usually have a big wide forehead 
and the hair usually comes out the sides, if you haven't noticed. Most clowns try to emphasize a high brow ridge with the black paint, and they often paint the inside of that brow ridge all the way down to the lid in blue because the Nephilim had glowing bright blue eyes. A lot of the Wanjin, as I showed you earlier, are depicted with big bright blue eyes. Um, you'll find it just in most depictions of the demons, big bright glowing blue eyes is very common. And blue eye shadow is a very common trait for the stereotype basic clown archetypal image. Um, sometimes the slit is also painted down the, the, the eye or across. Uh, serpents tend to have slits for pupils. So I think that's a big reference to that as well. And it's obviously a huge big one because of the big bulging eye thing that we're going on about earlier. So a big large forehead is because most of the skulls that have been found show that the, the Nephilim seem to have big elongated foreheads. That's another common trait of a Nephilim feature. And the clown always tries to depict themselves as like a pinhead or a cone head or a lot, a skull cap of some kind mm. with this wild, crazy flailing hair. So everything is a symbol. Everything is kind of like an archetypical image that references towards the Nephilim features. And um, that's just the face. If you go onto the body, they always wear a multicolored, fractaled colored costume of some kind, whether it's through Harley Quinn diamonds, polka dots, multicolors of any kind, or patchwork. Patchwork could be symbolic of the patchwork DNA, that they're kind of a cobbled together being that shouldn't exist. That's really out there in terms of metaphor. The multicolored clothing itself is probably just a reference to the multicolored nature of a serpent or reptile's skin. Reptiles are very psychedelic creatures, if you actually look at them. I mean, you know what an iguana looks like or a chameleon, for example. They have crazy colours all over the place. I think the seraphim angels would have also had similar features. Multiple different types of snakes with different features. The angels, too, had variety. So a lot of the Nephilim also came out with this multicoloured plumage patterns all over their skin as well. But the, the white face seems to be a common state that very rarely changes you might get the odd pattern on there uh, the odd psychedelic pattern under the cheeks as well or something and the oldest clowns um, which were first created do have seem to have that kind of block work pattern on their face kind of like a reptile's odd design you know um in terms of metaphor clowns are often depicted on stilts because the nephilim were giants the clowns are often depicted with giant shoes because clown because the giants they often have big gloves showing they have huge hands because the clown you know, the nephilim were giants and um, or they're depicted with a tiny umbrella because it's actually a normal sized umbrella they were just giants or a tiny hat because they're actually wearing a normal sized hat uh. because they're giants emphasize that point that they are bigger than they are actually depicted in real life you know it's tried to aggrandize their size in the metaphor of the image of a clown Whoa. um and and now let's get into the origin of the Western clown and why this is dodgy as hell and why this is actually by design and why we need to be extremely careful about what we choose to wear. Um, like I said, ignorance of the law does not make us safe from the law, basically. So <laughs> clowning itself, there's always been fools and jests and jokers as far back as it goes back to Egypt, you know, and they didn't look like how clowns today look, you know, if you come uh, just through the medieval period out of, um, let's say, you go back to ancient times, you know, Egypt had their own clown, jester-like characters, fools, bumbling idiots and fools throughout Greek theatre before and after Aristophanes. It was always the clown within the theatre of some kind, but it was always kind of like a parasite guy or somebody who drank a lot or somebody who was obsessed with food. It was more like a, a negative trait of, of an individual within that particular society of the time, which is deemed as foolishness. You know, it was never like a clown as we know it today. And they didn't dress like that. Going through the Middle Ages, you had jesters, and, and so the Dark Ages as well as the known as, you know, that medieval period. There were courtly jesters in Europe, which um, were basically kind of above the king. They were uh, allocated the honour of mocking the king um, to kind of keep him grounded and entertained, but no one else was allowed to do that. So it's kind of bizarre that you had these jesters who had this ability to mock the king but as far as clowns go they weren't clowns as we know them today it's circus clowns you know they didn't dress in white skin uh, and a white makeup or anything or color themselves up they just wore the bell crown to mimic the king and they had the scepter to mim mim mimic the king because that's what they were supposed to be that's the role they played and throughout you know higher end society the jester was allowed to sit with the rich people because the entertainment that they offered you know is that kind of 
allowance. Um, through Rome, there was always the clown for the Roman circus, um, but it was always, again, just buffoons, mumbling idiots, you know, mimicking a drunk, let's say, or something like that. Um, coming out of the, you know, the end of Rome, and let's say, I think it was uh, 400 AD to 500 AD, the collapse of Rome, you did have a lot of these performers from these circuses kind of traveling throughout Europe, going through the Middle Ages and, uh, the, let's say, you know, the medieval period. And these these performers were always around and they kind of melded themselves slowly through time into the Camille de l'Art movements coming out of the, the medieval period in the 16th century. So that's kind of like the evolution of a jester-like clown character very quickly summed up throughout history there, very quickly. There's always been comedians, okay? But a clown is something else. It's something very specific. And this is where it kind of, the clown started to appear in, in history. So... The Comedia de l'Art movement was basically a, a band of uh, travelling performers, which have always been performers of some kind. And they, what they did, they create these stock characters, which usually played a specific individual relevance that time. Uh, the rich industrialist, the servant girl, or the servant man, um, you know, the, things like that. You know, the the the, the brash old man, or the the young brave um, bachelor, all these type of stock characters you know and the, the, all these they would write scripts and make stories for these stock characters to get into all sorts of shenanigans and put on a rolling traveling show where people would basically put money into a hat at the end of the show and that's how they made their living and you'll find the harlequin was this this stock character within the comedian de l'art movements that's where it came from and you'll find that harlequin is actually based on um a germanic french folkloric creature called helikins and the helikins comes out of the wild man tradition now, if you search on Google, we can bring it up now. Um, cookery. How so you spell K that. Yeah, K U K U R I, and this comes out the Slavic traditions of the Wild Man festivals. Okay, so yeah. this this is another example of Nephilim veneration, but these are the people who do it because they believe they're scaring away the spirits. But what they're doing is dressing like K U K R I U R I. You said R I. Uh, cook, uh, sorry, it might be E-R-I, sorry, yeah, and that's the knife. <laughs> and just type in a there folk tradition. Ah. Yeah, Whoa. Oh, oh, it's, so very, the it's, also, it's very similar to what you saw in Africa with the, you know, the... Yep. The, yep. Crazy. the it's like a hay bale, thing. yeah, yeah. Whoa. These are identical. Yeah, yeah, so these are the wild men of Europe. If you scroll through, you'll find that this actually goes all across Europe, and there's different traditions doing this everywhere okay i mean everywhere so this is in bulgaria look at okay. those white now, indigenous like people <laughs> <laughs> whoa look at that bro what Chewbacca are looking dude. by the people doing this what are they purported to be what do they think they're doing like, they, it's actually a continuation they believe of a, of the dionysian thracian cult of the region from the ancient past dionysus was a yeah. uh, was a god of Greek pantheon he was actually an outsider god he was from other places mysterious to the greek uh, religion and he was basically the god of wine um sex debauchery theater plays things like that anything party related he was the guy um and if you look at some of these masks actually they, they get extremely clownish um, and they're basically Dionysus is is a great example of of a quintessential wild man he he traveled from uh, city to city, from town to town, with a horde of fawns. And Bro, me and look at that! Look at that! Yeah. The stranger thing. He would basically bring parties with him, and people would join his clan and move to the next city. You know, and um, these are the type of revelry that would take place when he would turn Whoa. up, and it's kind of a con <laughs> yeah. It's funny, um, but it was all it was all to excess, right? It was kind of like the dancing sickness where yeah. you just can't. Oh, it was stop. like the the that times Lollapalooza. People would just show up a festival, get weird, and be like, and also the Grateful Dead. People would just turn around with the dead and just like yeah. go to the city, city, Lose get themselves. weird, making bad decisions. But this one in particular, this is actually uh, it's been Christianized because they do this just before Lent now, um, but its roots are ancient, so it's a, it's a Dionysian Thracian. Wild man tradition of revelry. That one That's up amalgam up, yeah. an amalgam. Like that. What is that? Is that, is that is, some clan shit? That what is, is that? It's pointy hat. Oh, yeah. honestly, some, some of the presentations of these hats, they get covered in pom poms like a stereotypical party hat. Try and find more variations of that. Look just below that image that you've already clicked on, for example, and you'll find more variations. They get really party ish. They get really like. 
like a typical party hat well, you'd find in it. Sense. Oh, yeah, it gets, it gets weird. It gets really weird. Um, and this is basically now it's a way of scaring off all the demons before the start of Lent, you know. That's why they do it now. But its original sources were like the veneration of the Nephilim originally. You find a lot of these when you look into it, they don't really know why they do it. It's just tradition. You know, when you look at my research and the work I've done, I'm kind of uncovering the hidden depths as to why they do this and why it's so similar across multiple cultures. And let's type in, for example, let's go to Portugal now, so the other side of Europe, the complete opposite end of where Bulgaria is. Type in Kareto, C-E-R-E-T-O. We not have there oh, we go. Look at these guys. Damn, bro. What is this, Burning Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same tradition, just with a different aesthetical style. But this is, comes from the Celtic tradition, so not the Thracians. And this is very ancient. The Celts obviously dominated most of Northern Europe during the, the ancient times, and it's continued to today. And what they do is the young men dress in these bells and these multicolored outfits. They believe they're getting possessed by the devil, and they go around and cause mayhem in the town for a week. And they chase all the young women and, and shake their bells at them and all this type of stuff. And then they burn a giant effigy of, of uh, a Nephilim at the end, basically. And then it ush ushers in Lent. The Dude, time do you period think of Burning fasting. Man is this? Because they think, burn yeah. a, a giant man at the end. And they all dress like multicolored fractal jester well, clowns. As well, well yeah, I mean, like, They yeah. dress up. They do dress up. They don't dress up like this, but everyone's got outfits. Well, yeah, well man. they dress up like hooker versions yeah, of this. Agreed. It's like eyes wide shut shit. I mean, this These are the chicks that would bang the the, the fallen angels. That's oh. what they do. They go there. They dress up like Do you down think there. that's what Burning, am, Burning Man <laughs> is for? The fallen angels landing Burning Man. Be Fuck like, the ladies. Let's go it, dog, for the streets. Yeah, so, so basically what you're looking wow. at here, all these wild men of demons okay and they all know what they're representing is it's the demons they're dressing like the demon to ward away the demon just in time for for their period of fasting okay so it's been christianized and now i think it's naive to think that they're scaring anything away i don't think a demon's going to be scared of somebody dressing like it it just it's stupid to even say yeah. to be honest. This especially if they look like that thing with all the eyes and wings yo and that's stuff. even I mean, scary but yeah. it, this has the oh, uh shit. vibe of that movie where like there's nothing's illegal for a day what is that called oh, yeah the purge the purge like this has purge vibe on look at the purge it says purge everything looks like a scene from the purge yeah so this is actually a, a city not too far from it who does a similar tradition but they dress like this instead and um, here's an interesting so thing johnny and xavier as well um that that when we had dr dr longo on right he was talking about how the vikings like when they when they referred to Vikings, they weren't referring to the Native Americans, but they were referring. Uh, excuse me, when they were saying Redskins, it wasn't in reference to natives. It was actually in reference to pale white Vikings, and that the Redskin came from the like kind of suntan lotion that they would put on because their skin was so white, which is super interesting. Because now we're seeing this and seeing that and seeing that. <laughs> Right? Well, Which this is, is in Portugal. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's all the same shit. So you're saying the Vikings yeah. were possibly... Well, there was a discussion with El Dorado that the Vikings were one of the mm -hmm. lost tribes of Israel. Yeah. Well, you find a lot, a lot of these cultures, obviously, it's, it's carnival, isn't it? A lot of this translated yeah. through European carnival tradition. This is just a very older version of it. This is like, these are the oldest yeah, versions of it. Like he's getting kidnapped. Um, no, well, that's the thing. They're supposed to be scaring females. He said they They said those things run around town, scaring females and acting like it's like the devil type of thing. And then, then they burn well, out. In Georgia, they still have a practice. I mean, it's not as often, but my hair, the lady who cuts my hair, her sister was involved in this. She got kidnapped. They have kidnapped marriage in the mountains of Georgia where, like, you kidnap a woman and then you marry her. That's right. how they do it. Huh? But it's done on, like, a real kidnap? It's a real thing, yeah. Or Dude, her sister like and her father had to pay to, like, get her daughter back because she didn't want to marry this guy. I'll, I'll show it to you. But I wonder if that is just carrying on this tradition of uh, bride kidnapping here. That's that's what it's called. Uh, bride kidnapping, also known as marriage by abduction or marriage by capture, is a practice in which a man abducts a woman he wishes to marry. And this sounds just kind of like... Bride napping. Yeah, bride napping. It sounds just that like... That sounds this. like a show on, like, yeah. Bravo. Yeah, it really does. Of course they have the fuck in my country there. 
Yeah, of course, Mexico. Yeah. You guys are still in the weird. But shit. it seems like something yeah, that we saw your, my wife. by you know this race and then emulated possibly in our own. In our possibly, own I think a lot of these traditions do have like uh, more ancient connected roots than we know. You know, when these connect uh, when these cultures were more connected and more widespread, let's say. And we, obviously, we have a lot of different countries now and a lot of borders that are dividing these these traditions and separating them and changing them a lot. But I think these traditions were a lot more similar in the past, you know, and a lot more like they shared culturally ab- along bigger patches of land than yeah. today. Like I said, um, that the, what you're seeing there, the Kareto tradition was a tradition of the Celtic culture, which dominated a huge part of the land at one point. You know, it's just kind of survived into the modern era through tradition by chance. And um, just like the cookery, it's ancient. It's thousands of years old. But it's pretty much the same today as it was then, just slightly Christianized. You know, do you get what I mean? But the costumes are the same, for example. Um, so this wild man tradition I'm showing you here, this is where the Harlequin comes from. So the Helikins is the wild man of German tradition. He was described as a giant with a huge club covered in hair that basically had a band of demons, smaller deformed hybrid creatures that would follow him from village to village causing chaos and mayhem sounds just like dionysus but instead of chaos and mayhem dionysus would go around spreading a different kind of chaos and mayhem the uh, of ecstasy you know of partying of letting yourself become wild and lose your human restraints type of attitude well this is just a more demonized version of it through obviously um, the heavily christianized culture of the time so helikins this roving wild man which is what these traditions are based on a demon a nephilim basically nephilims and demons are the same thing just one disembodied one still has a body if it has a body it's still a nephilim if it's disembodied we call it a demon today so this demon is where Harlequin comes from. It's named after it. Um, it's named after, also named Arlecchino in, in the Italian phrase. So Harlequin, the character, would have originally a ragged clothing with patchwork multicolours all over it. And he would wear a, a beast mask, like a mask with a horn on it. And he would have a club. So he would be the wild man that with the club that wandered through Germany and France known as Helikins. Um, and obviously these were traveling performers who came out of Rome, who went all over Europe, even as far as Moscow. So they picked up this wild man tradition and, and incorporated the demon character into the plays. So as we come through the 16th century through to 17th century, the Harlequin character changes over, over the years. He is starts off as the magical witty sadistic character who's kind of outside of the play and has magical powers he would slap the stick so this is slapstick that's where it comes from and it would change the scene on the stage he was the one that controlled and orchestrated the narrative that's what harlequin's original role was he was a demon and that's what he was he had mystical magical demonic powers as the years went on his character throughout the rewriting of his character kind of became more of a a love interest for the rich person for Columbine was the daughter of the rich man, you know, and he would basically pine and chase after the Columbine and Punchinelli and the clown character, which wasn't looking like a clown by this point, but was kind of like a bumbling fool who was the servant of the rich man would try and stop Harley Quinn, who was also another servant from getting with the daughter. And that's where the comedy would arise, you know, it's, and, it, and his character would kind of evolve throughout Is that time. Is where the old um, puppet show would come from? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as it goes through time, it goes to England and it becomes Harlequins or Harlequinards. They go away from this comedic the last stock character and they become something called the Harlequinard, but the Harlequin is kind of the main character. And it would kind of amalgamate then into pantomime in the UK where you would have the puppets punch and judy is a good example of this you know and this is where the jesters of the past through the medieval age ended up they ended up in these plays through the comedic art movements you know because the need for court jesters kind of died out during the same time Mm -hmm. and they were still performing actors who ended up playing these roles in these um, comedic arts all the way through europe up until the 1800s so we're going this is where the clown first started to appear and they take more prominence over harlequin so throughout the 1700s, um, Harlequin's character was far removed from his original wild man demonic character form. He became like a bumbling fool, a bumbling idiot. He was no longer witty funny. He was foolish funny. Do you get what I mean? He was stupid funny rather than smart funny. Um, and 
to replace that character, Clown started to become more of the demonic witty entity. Okay, the, the, he took on the original role of, of the wild man demon and Clown started to become more of that character. And then in that build up to that period in the UK, there was a performer at the time who really popularized the clown and um, his name is uh, Joseph Grimaldi. And he is said to be the father of the modern clown. He is the person who invented the clown as we know it today. Um, so Joseph Grimaldi performed at theatres in London and the Sadler's Wealth Theatre as well. And he was a renowned acrobat. He, would, he could just do things with his body no one else could. And he could just flip and tumble and roll and backflip and all sorts nonstop all night. And he was like, people were like, this is amazing, you know. Um, and he would popularise the clown character to the point where Harlequin would just be replaced by him. He became the lead. So this is how the clown took prominence in this theatre movement. And during this time... Uh, the owner of the Sadler's Wells Theatre and basically Joseph Grimaldi's boss was somebody called Charles Dibidin. He was a Dibidin. So he was a prominent Freemason of the time. He was a prominent playwright, musician. He wrote a lot of sea uh, shanty music for mm -hmm. British sailors at the time in the British Army. He was a, a well-renowned creator of music and shows and productions. You know, he was an influential, rich person. And he was the boss of this clown at the time. And in, in the 1800s, under his rulership, his leadership, you know, he decided to do a costume change for the Harlequinards, the traditional Harlequin. And he is the one who created the brand new costume for the clown that we know today. So the clown itself has its roots in a representation of the wild man demon Nephilim. And that's where it comes from, <laughs> it's from through the Harlequin up into the clown. Harlequin, so it was the Harlequin which is Harley Quinn, becomes Harley Quinn, do you think? Yeah. yeah yeah so so harley harley quinn in obviously is it's referenced in uh, batman as well isn't it harley quinn the harley quinn comes from this comedia art movement all the way through europe these these italian actors which then became obviously a popular movement all the way up europe into britain as well so these harlequinards the lead character was originally harley quinn which was a representation of a jester or a demon or the wild man of Europe. That's where they picked up the character from and amalgamated it into the shows. So Harlequin is a demon, is a Nephilim. That's what his uh, true original purpose was. He got replaced by the clown to play that role. So the clown now becomes the demon, the witty one, the one with the powers, the one that's outside of the play, the one that has the ability to change the scenario and has the wit and the cunning, the evil side, you know? Um, and Harlequin becomes the bumbling idiot. So it, there was a role reversal switching character there. And then Charles Dibdin, this Freemason of the era, bang on 1800 here, 1800 is when this happened. He did a costume change and changed, redesigned all the costumes that would be worn for Harlequinards from then on. It had never been done before. So he was changing history here. And he basically made the Harlequin outfit skin tight with all the diamonds, the stereotypical one that we know of today with the uh, the hat that goes to one side. It's like a, a sailor's hat. Um, and he wore like a masquerade mask as well. Uh, and he would play the love interest from then on of Columbine. He would be the, the hopeless romantic. So he's far removed from his original demonic character. The clown now would become the mainstream popular demonic character. And that's where the clown costume changed from just a plain white loose garb. That's what the clown originally dressed like in the Harlequinards to this multicolored fractal pattern psychedelic baby outfit, which it became then. So type into Google uh, vintage clowns or old classic clowns and just look at what they used to look like from the, you know, it's, it's terrifying, the original form that clowns actually had. It's not what we have today. Um, oh my God, look at that, dude. Whoa. Look at that. No. Yeah. No. So that, where he's holding, that drawing there where he's holding the fish that and the pig in his hand. just like the old Medusa, right? With the thing around. Would not. Where, Absolutely. So if you scroll down to the bottom, that one there, that's the original clown. That's Joseph Grimaldi. That's the costume change he was then wearing. Um, so that's how clowns used to look originally. Now, I believe... Freemason, some Freemasonry are just a continuation of the serpent cults of the antediluvian age. They hold all the knowledge that was given to Cain and they occult it and hide it from mankind to maintain power. They are in communion with and cohort with clowns, okay? Nephilim, basically. That's what they do. They communicate with demons. They work with demons. I think they know what demons look like, okay? 
So I think this was a co-opting of the entertainments at the time, which was obviously the Camille de l'Arts performance of the Harlequin. And I believe he did a costume change, this Freemason called Charles Dibdin, to make the clown dress something similar to a Nephilim. And obviously took inspiration from a lot of these folk traditions that I showed you earlier, okay? Because the Freemasons are traveling men. They, they're they very worldly. They know a thing or two about folk traditions. And they know that folk traditions, which, like I showed you, are in communion with demons. They know that, okay? So what they have this done is, is they've incorporated, they've incorporated similar styles from all these folk traditions around the world and made it into this amalgam we call a clown today, which is why the clown has so many features you could associate with Nephilim. It was done on purpose. So then Joseph Grimaldi himself it said that he invented the clown makeup from there and made it what it is today. But historically speaking, it's Charles Dibdin, the Freemason, who recreated the outfit. You know, um, Joseph Grimaldi was just kind of a useful performer. I think he was just used as the as the scapegoat to explain where clowns come from. But realistically, the in the modern image of a clown has its roots in in the imagination of a Freemason. So there's that which is sketchy on, on its own right. And we already know, like I explained earlier, the clown and the Harlequin itself is a literal representation of a demon called the Wild Man. That's yeah, where it comes from. Even the from. big feet, right? I mean, it all tracks with what you're saying. Oh, well, Bigfoot! Bigfoot is a wild man. Yeah. You know, if you the Bigfoot phenomena of, of tall, hairy creatures all over the earth, it's not just in Europe, it's everywhere. Wow. The Pacific Northwest of America is a prime example of where you find Bigfoot phenomena, but you'll find it on every continent all over the earth. I've just written a chapter about it in my book, actually, where I've listed them, all, all of them. <laughs> so uh, you'll find it's just, it's just a phenomena everywhere. They're like the modern day versions of Nephilim. I don't think they look as serpentine or colorful as they used to. Um because they're so watered down and humanized. Uh -huh. They look like big brutish ape men now. That seems to be where it's come down to. But um, that's the origin of a clown. You know, it has its roots in a Freemason imagination. And I do believe this was done intentionally with the understanding I explained earlier. So what they've found a way to do essentially is f manage to venerate their gods in public, out in the open, without the public knowing it. That's how the occult work. Okay. Amazing. We just think it's a funny thing for the kids. It's a clown. It's nothing serious. We don't take it seriously, of course. But what they're dressing like is no different than how people dress in these folk traditions all around the world. And what they're doing is dressing like the thing to evoke the thing. You know, they just don't know that that's what they're doing, whoever puts on the costume. But if you look at uh, Shriners, for example, which is um, the next step up from Freemasonry. Yeah. yeah so yeah. all have to be Freemasons first. Okay. You don't just get to be a Shriner unless you've gone through all the levels of Freemasonry. Once you get to Shrining, all of them have a sect, which is the Shriner Clowns. All of them. And you have to become a clown when you become a Shriner. You have to dress like a clown. Yeah, they do that at and events it, and stuff, right? They ride damn, around on little bicycles and stuff. Bro. It's funny, my uncle tried to get me to become a Shriner. I was, I didn't know it was all, and they, all this. They claim, they claim it's, oh it's for charity. Oh my god! That's so, but what insane! Done, invented something that they can wear where they can openly summon demons and be possessed by them and no one knows right in your face yep. and then they'll go to children who are dying oh they'll go to circuses it's so much wow. fun look at all this fun oh so much fun you want to sit next to wow. the clown i gotta talk to my uncle yeah. that's some no what? he's never gonna understand this ever what? you can't tell hey you're worshiping the nephilim well, I, I mean, uh, I, what are you talking about, Johnny? Did you ever? I'm just gonna. Hollywood I'm not gonna Momo. ask. I'm not gonna come up to him like that. And be like, hey, when you were riding that bike in the clown outfit, you ever feel any kind of weird sort of? Uh, Paul, like this has been a great episode. It's been amazing. Thank you. It's trippy. Hey, yeah, Paul, I mean, can I ask you really quickly before we finish? You mentioned in the beginning if if that you had some experiences that uh, that caused you to uh, grow in faith uh, in, in, in the belief in a deity. Is there anything that is uh, striking and, and, and easily uh, relayed that you could share with us there? Um, he, he, if I, through addiction, I managed, I managed to end my addictions to psychedelics, cannabis, and things like that, everything through through him. That's one miracle I worked to my own life personally. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I, but I also, I did a lot of DMT and acid and psychedelics and things like that. And I saw some things, you know, which proved to me that it was real. So that's one mate. I kind of cut it through a weird way, you know, mm -hmm. and in a way he's kind of from that world and pulled me out of it, which is 
why I have such a strong faith, which is pretty unshakable because I, I can't deny the things I've seen and experienced myself, if you get what I mean. But what I'm saying is if, if I compare myself to who I was, um, you know, eight years ago to where I am today, it's, it's a different, I'm a different person, you know, um, and I was on a downward path to destruction then, and I've kind of come out of it. And now I have, a, I have a good life and you know, I'm married with a son and everything's different, you know, oh, and everything and I have purpose, you know, and that's just something that um, I think a lot of people are craving Absolutely. this day and age. And, you know, um, this research I've done, obviously all of this stuff I've been doing for years has helped make me have a clear image and understanding, which has brought me closer and stronger in faith. Um, and everything I'm researching currently with this topic, which again, we've only just scratched the surface, go to my YouTube channel to get all the depth stuff for, you know, there's so much information there that we haven't even touched on. Um, but it, it goes so deep and, and this has only just edified my faith more, all this research, to be honest, just seeing how true the biblical history is and how connected it all truly is, to be honest. Dude, this has been an insane show. We're going to put this out tomorrow. Uh, it's been an insanely great show. I appreciate it. It was great. Mate, I, I Come back and talk about the music industry, the film industry, where it's, it's everywhere. This All stuff right. goes deep. We're going to get into it, it dude. Way. You crush it. You knocked out of the park. Thank you so much. Uh, one more time, where can they find you? Um, right, on YouTube, Understanding Conspiracy. You'll All find right. a six-pointed yellow star logo. That's me. That's where you'll find me. Um, there it is. Just type it in. Don't type in Paul Stobb as my name. I've never tagged myself in any of my videos like that. You'll have to type in Understanding Conspiracy to find my channel. I do look other plenty of other things, but if you go to my playlists, there is a playlist there, which is called The Neff Live Look Like Clowns, and everything I've done so far on, on it is there. Um, it's That's the current one there. I did a breakdown of um, one of Gorilla's songs where they represented a Nephilim being. <laughs> so, so there's loads of stuff there. Um, 39 episodes so far are a lot more to come uh, but that, that'll map out the entire journey for you if you're interested um, but yeah the music industry is something we need to get into uh, the practice of dressing oh, like whatever. a clown is that supposed to be a Nephilim in the gorillas, in the eh? gorillas? don't yeah. ruin the gorillas dude God. what do you mean the they're a cartoon and a band I mean what they're do you great mean? now I can't so now I think I'm over here playing this now the Nephilim's gonna pr pull up in my car yeah bro yeah bad energy well, what First word that demon says in the music video. Do you remember? No. Finally, someone let me out of my cage. <laughs> right. Whoa. God, and it comes out all the time. Dark. Comes out the heart. You know? MTV played that so much too. So much. Hey, you crushed this. This was great. So I'm very thankful you're coming on. It's such a great episode. Again. Click the link below. Understand conspiracies. Support Paul. He's doing great. Uh, he's got great stuff. Sorry for the stupid joke. It was just a joke, but it was stupid. Um, I mean, was, I have a sense of humor. It's all right. Okay. I just <laughs> I just enjoyed this episode. I don't want you to think. I, I just sometimes I learn not to listen to my mouth. Or so, like I just talk and then apologize later. But it was a joke. Um, anyways, go check out his uh, website. Support him. This has been On Point. Guys, Check out our affiliate programs. There's so much amazing affiliate stuff going on. Check it out. We got the best of the best. I'm only working with brands I think you need help that will help you when you need it. And then I'm going and then uh listen to these highlights, man. All my other shows have been fire lately. Numbers are up. People the shows are resonating with people. So check it out. They're growing. Uh be a part of it. Uh and we also have um we don't smoke the same if he actually sends it in to Johnny. We'll add that to it. Check it out. Support the shows. Love you guys. Enjoy these highlights. Here's a clip from the latest Broken Sim. I wish I could be here more, but I really think Bill has everything under control. This morning, for example, he came into the Oval Office for our meeting, and I said, Mr. President, is everything all So I think this is from the Academy Awards in like the 90s. Is, is the best I can get. I don't know. It's like a sketch but from the, the Academy Awards. I know they added the music. They added them. anything with that music is going to be a little creepy. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, you could be watching like Jeopardy yeah. with that music, and you would be yeah. like, Alex Lower Trebek is a murder. Just a little bit. Lower it down, just a tiny. Bit. It sounds louder in your headphones because I have your headphones turned okay. way up to keep you from screaming. Um. Okay. Right. I want to thank the Academy for this tremendous honor. This may be the greatest moment of my life. I mean, ever since I was a little boy, I wanted to be a real. Like, so Kevin Spacey walks there's in. Nobody in there, this group that has not been accused of. <laughs> yeah, not Damn one it. person in this video. I cut that out too.
Hold on. So what's happened is Kevin Spacey has appeared over yeah, Bill yeah, Clinton, who's yeah. rehearsing his Academy Award speech in the yeah, mirror, yeah. over his shoulder, and is like menacing him right now. Yeah. Making him return the Academy Award that he's practicing with. So creepy. I don't. I don't know. I, I feel like if you put that music under anything, anything yeah. like you could put it on Romper Room. <laughs> and all of a sudden, right, we could try that. Right, let's do it. Let's do it. Hold on. Okay. Let's find Rom. What is that music? No, I'm just going to play. I'm, I can play that video in the background and then we'll play. We'll play Romper Room. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> this morning, for example, <laughs> you came to the Oval Office for a meeting <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, is everything all right? I want to thank the Academy for this tremendous honor. This may be the greatest moment of my life. I mean, Hold on, I know how to make I was it creepy, boy, yeah. I wanted to be a real actor. Oh, that is so creepy, bro. That's so creepy, bro. What is she doing with that mirror, dude? Wait, <laughs> dude, that's that's so creepy, dude. Like, what is up with her? Do you never watch Romper Room? No, this is way before my time. What is this thing? I don't even know, bro. <laughs> That's so, so weird, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's so creepy. Let me slow it down even a little bit. Yeah, dude. Anything with that music is weird, man. I look, wish I could look, be it, here more, but I really that cr what is that, that weird thing like wearing a blanket or whatever? This morning, for example, I <laughs> came into the Oval Office for our meeting, and I said, Mr. "Yeah, that's Prince, weird, dude. All right? <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking weird, oh, man. That's so weird, bro. Uh, so okay, weird. what do we have here? That's so so this is uh, speaking of weird. Yeah, here's here's something. Okay, so this guy has been. This guy, whose name is Nick Sorter, yeah. has been in Maui, uh, or has been in Hawaii the whole time covering this thing, the fire. Yeah, this and is really weird, He bro. is being stalked, getting death threats, and one of the stalkers walks up behind him while he's on Steve Bannon. So say what you will so about Steve weird, Bannon. so weird, right? And it's People's minds here. bizarre. So he's talking, doing like a, you know, an on-location shot over zoom or something and this guy appears over his shoulder kind of like kevin spacey in that yeah, last video yeah and it's just menacing him again By staring the way, at him you totally play that music right now hey what's up nick i've been trying to reach you I've been reaching out to you on x um you're supposed to be uh meeting with people here Who do you, what victim uh, okay yeah so this is this is so you're seeing this live right now people actually track they yeah. track me down and you're staying in a tent. You said you were coming and staying in a tent. You're taking uh, up resources. I'm not you're taking up here. any resources here. People's minds That's here. So creepy. And he it's, just it's, keeps his going. Weird, the, yeah. He, his, he just keeps going. And it's so weird. And why don't they. Uh, the only reason I turn my back on the aggressor, awesome. go down. He's just saying he was monitoring his video feed. Okay. People were saying, I think people were trying to say it might have been staged or something. And he was. Go down, go down. You think? I, I want to go back to, I want to see if we can find more video of this, if he's been doing anything else. Like oh, he was, wait, what is, oh, no, that was, that's old when he was, Tucker was still on there. I was hoping, I would like to see the rest of that. Like what happened there is. Here's what happened yesterday. I was reporting. That's the same clip. It's, yeah, the, it's same clip, the same clip. But why I was does it was just all... stop? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering too. Like, what happens after that? Anyway, uh, yeah, it's bizarre, man. I mean, and the guy has been. Uh, he says he's been harassed for trying to report on what's really going on there. Now, it's entirely possible he staged that. I, 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 I don't know, but it seemed genuine to me. I mean, there was a there's a weird quality to it for sure. Yeah, these fires are just. Sucks. I mean, you can't escape it. Yeah, it's uh, it's everywhere. 
Yeah. It's dumb. I, I, that's why I think they screwed up, man. They went too big with this. They tried to bite out. You know, like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people have been galvanized by this thing. People are really pissed. I, I hope. It seems like it. Don't you feel like there's more energy? Uh, anyway, let's get to something more positive. Uh, another stupid. Uh, this woman, you sent me this. Yeah, I mean, this is fun with stupid. Now, this is the let's definition. Let's just take a moment. Her face is cute, right? Can we agree on sure. that? She's yeah. cute. Yeah. Now, if she gave a shit about herself. Oh, I feel like she gives a lot of shits uh, every day. Three times a day. It's but watch possibly. This. Let's watch it. So, she's so what we're seeing here, if you're listening at home, a woman, as he said, with a cute face, Chunky quite, Mac quite, is her name. quite Chunky large. Mac. Her TikTok is Chunky Mac, M-A-K, if you want to follow her. Uh, and she's a heavy, heavy woman. Friendly reminder. Going to the gym doesn't make you better than anyone else. Yeah, it does. Yes, and what I have to say is that she's actually right it, because not going to the gym gave her four four titties total. She's got two sets of tits, and dude. I've never she, seen she this has before. To have underwear to hold up her gut. Look at oh, that. she's so happy that high waisted underwear are in now oh because if she didn't, that God, would just be spilling dude. out. But have you ever seen four titties before? No, it's unbelievable. She's like a like a pig with dude, uh, what is this that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where that chick had three tits? She's got four tits. <laughs> Now a clip from Conspiracy Social Club. All you guys are taking this chief of the emergency response and you're trying to ruin his life. What do you with all your oh rumors? My God, and Brian. it's irresponsible. Brian, it's <laughs> irresponsible. Brian, did you say what is the worst take I could take on this video? So what are you doing? Is that what you did? So what are you doing? You're doing the same you're doing bit, the same thing with this guy Ray Epps. Decimal you guys did the same shit with Ray Epps. In the old library. You did the same shit with Ray Epps. You're doing the same shit with this. Because Ray Epps is a fed. That's he just why. got arrested. <laughs> Ray Epps he just is got a arrested. He just got arrested, Sam. He's a fed, bro. He got arrested. Okay? Yeah, because he's a fed. No, he's not a fed. He's a fed. No, he's not. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I'm not doing this. Okay, bye. Have a great day. No, Brian. No, Brian, we're asking questions because people died, Brian. We're asking questions because people died. A few moments later. Okay. But I'm calm now. Okay. Uh, I want to apologize for my outburst. Oh, wow. But not apologize. Okay. <laughs> because sometimes so, I think... where are you going to be, Brian? Some things where are, are going to be, Brian? Some things are worth losing your where mind Where are you going to be? And that's one of them. Hey, guys, real quick, I want to tell you about all the wonderful stuff we got going on at SamTripley.com. Check out TimFallHatTshirts.com. We got two more about to go on. Some brand new shirts, so check that out. My cameos are fire as well. Cameos are fire. I'm giving you three five-minute cameos going deep dives into everything conspiracy, or I'm giving you positive reinforcement, whatever you need. We're doing birthdays too, right? We're doing birthdays. We're doing bar mitzvahs. We're doing, <laughs> you're about to lose your, lose your virginity. You're going to have your first threesome. Whatever it is, I'm going to encourage you to do the best you can and drop the hammer of the gods. Guys, I also want you to check out uh, Wise Wolf Gold and Silver. I'm part of their Wise Wolf pack. Uh, I'm buying gold for, and silver or precious metals from them every month. Join me. Get those precious metals for the end of times or at least the end of the fiat dollars. We also have, I love some of these other stuff, uh, Aqua Cure Hydrogen Brown Gas. We've had uh, the inventor on. We've loved it. Wiseman's told us about the importance of hydrogen Get it. People, I have people at my last show tell me how much they love this stuff. So go get it. You use the promo code. You'll get a little discount. Come on. Get yourself some hydrogen brown gas, everybody. It's a great way to support the show. Harley Ray Candles and Crystals, some of our favorite people on the planet. This is a great way to get your mystic on, your mysticism on. You need to fight off the powers of evil and use these candles, these crystals, the sage. It's all there, a one-stop shop for all of your mystical stuff that you need. And our new affiliate, Tim James and Chemical Free Body. I love his stuff. I use it all the time. He's one of the best in the food gut industry. Check him out. He's got the best supplements. He's he, dude, he's got the best workout programs. I love him the pieces. Check him out. He's a good friend of me. We talk all the time. He's got everything you need to get the right vitamins, the right balance, and everything. And if you use the promo code TIMFOIL, you get 5% off. So check it out. Help us help you help us help you. And enjoy. We go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind.
drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat.